Hello, my name is Niels Kerrigan. I'm also from Dynamo and I have the honor to host the second session of our information day today. And uh, I have another honor, which is uh, to introduce my colleague, uh, Matthias. Uh, Matthias has been very active in the forming group at Dynamo. Uh, he holds a master, well, in Germany we would say diploma, um, in applied mechanics. So it's a very theoretical basis. <clears throat> But we will see some practical applications today. Uh, the title of his talk is Simulation of Resistive Heating of Titanium 64 Blanks. I'm keen to see what's that about. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Niels, for the kind introduction. And sorry to the stream, it's me again. Um, well, today I would like to talk on um, uh, some insights uh, we, we obtained from a research project and uh, in that project we aren't alone. We have our partners from uh, company Hegemann and also from the Chair of Material Science at the University of Erlangen. And this research project is uh, publicly funded. Um, we recently changed from energy to climate action. So initially it was funded by the Economic Affairs and Energy. Now, okay, they renamed. Um, we shuffled the um, agenda of the second session a bit because I have more um, material science point of view on that topic. So it makes more sense to start with that and then um, my colleagues will continue. Um, what is my outline? I would like to introduce the material titanium 64 a bit um, and then talk on uh, coupled simulations um, and then on also self-controlled simulations. And if I have time left, I will discuss uh, the topic material data a bit and maybe raise some questions. Um, so titanium itself is, as raw material, rather cheap. And what makes titanium expensive is the refining process uh, to the structural material which you can use for your constructions. Um, and due to that, it was initially mostly used by military aerospace industry and then later by civil aerospace industry. And in the last decades, we also see other applications out of the aerospace um, industry. Think on uh, implant heads or teeth or sports gear, or even uh, glasses are sometimes made of uh, titanium. Depends on how much you want to spend. And interestingly, um, at least in the Western world, according to that source, um, 60 or nowadays roughly 70% of the used titanium is made up by one alloy. And that is the titanium 6-aluminum uh, 4-vanadium. So usually in automotive industry you say, okay, DP800, that's not an alloy, that's a steel grade. Um, and uh, here we have directly the alloy composition in the name. And yeah, this is the most used one. And uh, I also have some yeah, current information from the March of this year, from this uh, uh, Zine magazine, so to say, and uh, the quotes are in German, but I think you get the main message of them uh, also in English. So the big uh, OEM, aerospace OEMs, uh, took one third uh, or one half of their titanium supply uh, from, the, uh, from a Russian company, which leads to some supply issues um, in this uh, spring. And then another quote says, okay, uh, it's, it's from March. Um, there was no titanium left on the market. Everything was bought. And they hope that the conflict, at this time, they hope that the conflict will not last until next year, but okay, who knows. Um, and in that, in that topic, we are now with our uh, research project, which follows the aim to um, develop a predictable quench forming process for energy and material efficient um, production process and material efficiency is quite a hot topic if there is no material to buy or less material to buy on the market. Um, and of course, as I'm a forming guy in our company, uh, we do that on uh, sheet metal parts and of course we want to uh, enhance mechanical properties of this alloy during this process. Um, the whole process is called TISTRAC, and TISTRAC is like all in research projects, it's an acronym for something, and in our case it's Titanium Solution Treated and Rapid Quenching, and um, that's what we do mostly, and our aim is to come from the semi-finished part or from the, from the uh, coil uh, during that uh, TISTRAC process to single parts which, which then can be joined together to sub-assemblies or whatever. 
And the TISTRAC pr process, we defined it uh, on several operations. This is typical in forming. Um, the first one is a cutting and a perforation. So usually in sheet metal forming the outline of the blank, so where you start with, um, dramatically influences your drawing behavior and your forming result and the process. Um, then we will heat it up with a resistive heating complex, um, then position it inside a tool, do the quench forming in a cooled part, uh, in a cooled tool, then we will have some additional cooling outside the, uh, the tools, a spring back, a form deviation or a shape deviation. Um, then we have a final cutting and in addition an um, additional aging step. We can compare this process to other processes known from automotive industry or also aerospace industry and we can do that best, as I think, on that schematic heat treatment. Um, and I decided to, to put into this one um, four, oh, three processes for three families of materials and this one is a press hardening of 22 MMB5. I think it's the only structural steel in a body in white where the automotive guys give the alloy composition. All the others have names like trip steel or DP800 or interstitial free, name them. But this one has the alloy in the name. And um, yeah, the other one is so-called press hardening of aluminum, uh, of 6,000 and 7,000 aluminum alloys. And the third one is our TIS track process. Um, if you first take a look on the technological parameters, um, you can compare, for example, the melting temperature. And you may see, so we take a look on the uh, raw materials here. Uh, you see, okay, titanium may be in the same range like steel or like iron-based materials. The product of heat capacity and density gives you an insight how many energy you need for your process to heat up the material and how many energy you need to bring out of the material during the quench forming process. And they are in the same range, so we may can stick to the same tooling technology. What is a big difference is the thermal conductivity and, um, well, titanium isn't a very good-minded uh, uh, material in this case because it has a very low thermal conductivity, meaning if you have a mistake in your temperature profile locally, this mistake will remain for a long time. So if you have a wrong temperature in aluminum, due to um, thermal conductivity, the heat will, uh, or the temperature will go to the neighboring one. But in titanium, it will take much longer time for that. And um, this makes processes a bit more difficult. So if we take a look on some, oh, sorry, uh, take a look on some technological or process parameters, we have, sorry, we have uh, different temperature and time schemes for aluminum. It depends on the alloy. So there are several alloy compositions with several heat treatment paths. So it's a rough. Uh, to give you some impression about it. Um, and here you can see, okay, steel and titanium are in a similar range um, from the temperatures, but from the time we are aiming at a much shorter time. The press technology can be nearly the same, hopefully, we will see that. Um, and then at the end, um, in automotive industry, mm, in my experience, many people forgot or ne not neglect, but um, are not aware that there is an additional heat treatment step at the end of the finished part, uh, which is the paint dryer. And there you have approximately um, 15 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius. So that's enough for a, a pizza and also for aluminum alloys to, uh, to harden. Um, and uh, yeah, as we are not in automotive industry with T-Strack, we say, okay, we need that additional heat treatment compared to automotive, because the automotive guys may are not aware of this. So we are not press hardening titanium, we are doing T-struck, which is press hardening plus annealing. Um, and if you take a look, a coarse look on the properties, uh, wrong one, on the properties, um, when you do the press hardening of steel, you get an increase on the ultimate tensile strength of approximately 200%. So you go from 500 to 1,500. That's good. It should protect you. Um, in aluminum, you have nearly nothing. You have some solutes contribution, uh, contributing to, to hardness. Um, and in titanium, you also have a martensitic transformation, but it just increases uh, the strength by 5%. And the heat treatment at the end, for steels, for this kind of steel, it does not do much on the tensile strength. 
for aluminum, it defines most of their properties. Um, so depending on the alloy again, it's up to 100%. And in our titanium, we are talking on 20%, 15% based on literature data. So that's not that huge what we were coming to simulate. I mean, factor three is something you, you will notice, even with a very coarse uh, measurement equipment, but 20% requires some effort. Um, if we take a deeper look on what's going on in titanium, so the automotive industry may call it uh, DP1000 because it's a dual phase structure consisting alpha and beta phase. And um, it will, uh, the beta amount will increase with raising temperature. And this beta amount depends on the discrete temperature. And we are aiming at a uh, mixture of 50% alpha and 50% beta. And that makes, uh, if you take a look on this graph, you see the composition of alpha depending on the temperature. And you see, okay, 50%, it's approximately here in this range, but you see also there are measurement data in literature which are outside of this box. So it's also difficult to, to measure this one. Um, what is easier to do is take a look at room temperature and take a look to what was before. And grains are a bit like uh, Roman provinces. If you had them 2,000 years before, you still see their borders today. Think on Belgium, for example. And um, we see in our microstructure at room temperature, we see what we had at 950 degrees. And we call that phase transformed beta phase or prior beta phase. And um, inside this prior beta grain, um, there occurs the martensitic transformation and it remains some meter-stable beta. And that is a combination of let's, what, what the automotive guys know from press hardening of steel and annealing of aluminum. So in titanium, we combine both effects, but just one has a strong influence on the um, properties. And that is the annealing step where we precipitate fine alpha grains inside this meter-stable phase. Um, so that all together, we don't have good temperature behavior because we have a, high, uh, a very low conductivity and the temperature is quite important for our process, motivates the simulation. And there I do the, uh, luckily I work with LS Dyna and have several solvers to use. Um, and in my case, I used these three ones and I do a coupling between uh, EM, uh, thermal and mechanical, but I was a bit lazy and say, okay, all mechanical boundary conditions or all nodes are constrained. So I neglect mechanics totally. Um, so if we think on what to add uh, on an existing hot forming simulation is we just need to add the heating part and therefore we have, wrong one, therefore we have the, um, yeah, for the electrostatic case we have uh, these equations and the FE part is uh, when we solve this one, the electric potential. If we know the potential we can calculate the electric field. With the electric field and one material property we can calculate the current flow so the electric current, and that current flow then acts as a heat source with, this Julesian, uh, with the Julian law, uh, which is then a heat source in the thermal solver. I do not like equations, even if I'm a mechanic, I like pictures more. Um, so what we do typically is we simulate or we calculate the potential field between, between two potentials, and then we calculate the current flow, and with that we calculate the heating. That is trivial for a regular shaped geometry like a rectangular, um, but as we are doing forming, and we are doing forming with um, contoured or with shaped blanks, we do not know how the current will flow and what temperatures we will have. So I'm sure these red arrows in this example are wrong. It was my guess, but yeah. Um, so what we need in LS Dyna is rather simple if we just take this add-on into account. So we first need the turn on, uh, turn, yeah, we need to power on. So we need this EM control, and there we can specify that we want to make a resistive heating. There are further ones, but we are stick to resistive heating. And we can specify the dimension. There is a two-dimensional approach available, which is quite interesting for industry. Also, some time step needed, like every time. Um, okay. We then need material uh, data, and that's interesting in the EM solver, you put the EM behavior uh, uh, pack to the mechanical behavior. So it's like a mud at erosion. Uh, we, we add the conductive behavior uh, due to the same use of this material ID. 
So in this case, the mechanical material with ID1 will be a conductor. That has influence on my modeling approach, um, but later uh, I will tell you later more. And then we need to define boundary conditions, and that are two isopotentials, and virtually connect them to a cycle. And um, this is isopotential connect. And then LS Dyna will calculate the current flow between. That sounds nice. So let's go a bit into uh, some examples. We had uh, this facility, which is installed at Hegemann, uh, to measure um, pressure-dependent heat transfer coefficients. Um, and this was added by this um, heating facility. You see here two cooled copper clamps or pairs of copper clamps where a sheet is clamped and then the current or the energy goes through and heats the blank up. And for a mechanical guy, you reduce the model to simply the free strip of the blank. And then you just define the boundaries and then you don't need to mess up with these uh, electrical contact conductance, which we can simulate in LS Dyna, but I do not want to get the data for it. Um, so I put this cooling effect of the copper clamps into an additional boundary, uh, boundary condition. And I would say it's easier to calibrate one parameter than to calibrate eight parameters. Um, okay, I also have some results. I speed up a bit. We have a blank with a thermocouple to measure the temperature, delivering this result. And we have a thermal imaging camera above. You should see a video. Yes, I cut it from the beginning and from the end. Um, it's getting hotter soon and soon, hopefully. Now we got it. Um, and we will have this temperature profile. And then we also do the simulation with this first uh, approach. And we end up with this one, with this yellow uh, curve. And what can be seen is, okay, the heating is quite well. The cooling is quite well. The peak isn't that good, and the beginning isn't that good. What happened? We had a student with a smartphone um, capturing the current with a multimeter, and he typed everything out of his smartphone video, so it was a very professional measurement of the current. Um, so maybe that's the reason for this. Um, and this gap is something we, uh, we, we may discuss later. Um, okay, this one was very good, and we continue with the self-controlled simulation. I have some minutes left, I think. Um, if you followed me, you may notice that I cut off some part of the blank and that I told you before that the blank outline is quite important for metal forming. So I need to add something. Um, and I created a small workflow with using of LS Dyna to, to prepare the blank for the simulation. And in metal forming, we know control forming trimming and I um, combine many of these keywords. Here you see the Dyna in files, the result files of these several calls. And at the end, I have two parts describing the blank. And the middle part is the conductor, and the outer one is the part inside the clamps. So everything is done by LS Dyna um, with this trimming. This trimming is also used to create the perforation. The perforation is a patent holding by company Hegemann to bring in geometrical features into the blank to control the heat flow, uh, the heat creation. And no designer would like to create these small holes for all of this uh, side. And again, we used the trimming keyword in LS Dyna to um, make LS Dyna make these holes. And here you see the result of it. Uh, we can use metal forming features for it. Uh, we have a, a mesh refinement around these holes and uh, with that, we can easily create the blanks for the simulation without spending too much pre-processing effort. Okay, uh, wrong one. Yeah, okay. Um, what else I would like to share is my, my favorite keywords of all time. <laughs> um, it's the general option for many set definitions and there you can specify one condition and every node in this case, fulfilling this condition will be added to the set. In my case, I used uh, box, box definitions to specify the area where I want to apply my isopotential and also where I want to have a virtual thermal element. And if I change the mesh, the boxes will be evaluated by LS Dyna at the initialization and then all the definitions referring to this set will be still valid and active. I do not need to click in LS3Post or somewhere else. So I can quickly change my, uh, my mesh. 
Um, if we have this uh, virtual thermal element with a defined sensor, where I get the average temperature of all of these blue nodes, um, I can use it for a self-controlled simulation. The real-world process has a PID-controlled current flow based on the measured temperature. And the question was, can we simulate that? Yes, we can. Um, many boundary conditions of LSDINA uh, refer to a load curve or a defined curve, and there is defined curve function. And in defined curve function, you can define many mathematical expressions. And also the PID CTL is predefined, which is a PID controller. And you need just some parameters, like a sensor signal, like a reference value, and then you can you can define a boundary conditions a boundary condition without knowing how large the boundary condition is, and let LSDINA more or less decide on its own how large your current flow should be. And we did that, or I did that at the beginning, and I end up with these results, which my colleagues from Hegemann told me no, that's not what we have. It looks like a two-point uh, uh, controller. And I was thinking about, okay, what's happening? And um, at some point, I noticed, okay, the time step is too big. That depends on how we couple the fuse together. And if I do a very small time, if I use, a, sorry, oh, if I use a very small time step, I will end up with this current over time, and with, with uh, sorry, with this temperature over time, and with this current over time, which looks much smoother, but plan with, in this case, in this multi-coupled case, plan with factor 200 for your simulation time. So it's really, really expensive in my, in, in my opinion. Um, but we are not using that quite often, so there's a lot of uh, simulation where we have a heating of uh, an S-rail blank with perforation. Right, you can see the thermal imaging, and on the left you can see the um, simulated temperature field. And what was impressive for me is that we were able to capture these peaks here. They are not synchronous. Um, yeah. So when you think on material data, you know, okay, there's a lab, you do some specific tests, and they have defined conditions, everything, but nobody tells you in which state the material is at that point. Usually you don't find that in literature. And if you, for example, take material simulation programs like JMAT Pro or Thermocalc, you can see that for different temperature profiles, you get in this case, a different phase composition, and the mechanical, physical, every property is connected to this phase composition, to the phases. And if you have different phase composition, you end up with different properties. In our case, we have the heat capacity, we have the electric conductivity, and the thermal conductivity. And for us, quite important is the latent heat, which um, gets free or which you need when a phase transforms to another phase, it's also sticked to when this phase transformation occurs. So you need to know when you get this additional heat to really calculate the real temperature profile inside your material. And um, what we also did is uh, some, some years ago, together with the University of Cottbus, uh, we implemented a material model for titanium for this specific alloy um, covering these phase transformations. But I have to put a big... Um, Exclamation mark here. We are not sure if this is applicable here because literature in, on Titan is, isn't that um, uh, clear or specific what is going on inside the material. Um, so this is just to get you some impression. Um, I have two points on, on our specimen and I have two different temperature profiles. Thank you. And on the right you can see for each of these points uh, what is going on inside the material spoken on the phase composition. And in that cold spot, nothing happens. We are below a certain temperature before something can start inside the material. And on that hot spot in the mid, um, a lot of things are going to happen. So we have transformation from alpha to beta, from beta to alpha, and back forth, depending on the temperature. And this is maybe something we want to know in the future. Um, so this is what this small picture should indicate. So we have this uh, transformation inside the process. Um, and this, maybe we need to cover it, um, maybe not. It depends on what uh, or how far we would go into that uh, research project. So at the end, I would like to, to summarize. So multi-coupled uh, simulations are possible. Self-controlled, multi-coupled simulations 
are possible, but maybe not yet recommended. We need to spend some effort maybe on that. And we can use this one for, for three scenarios in this uh, research project. The first one is, let's say, the rather uh, industrious one. Uh, we can check if the temperature field is homogeneous in the entire part. So it's maybe some aerospace approach. If you do every time the same, you will end up in the same result. You just have to, to sign that you do every time the same, or you, you have to ensure that you're doing every time the same. And this maybe can be done with this uh, simulation to check if the blank outline leads to homogeneous temperature profiles. Um, this can be done quite fast because there is a 2D simulation available. So checking one blank requires on my old laptop, this one, something like five minutes. And then I see, okay, how, how inhomogeneous is the temperature field. So that can be really done in an uh, industrial environment. Um, the self-control simulation may gets us an expectation what we can have in our real world current, uh, current time profile. And if we track that in the real world production, we can compare it to that, uh, uh, to that expectation. And also we can use that current profile to check if we should um, do a more QA on a specific part. Because if they have the same current profile, they may have the same properties. And the, the fourth one, uh, the third one, maybe the most advantage, uh, most difficult one, is to really simulate what's going on inside the material in a macroscopic uh, scheme and predict the mechanical, the final pr mechanical properties and then hand over this information to the, uh, to the design area that they know, okay, in this part or in this area of the part, I have 1,000 megapascal uh, tensile strength. In this part, I have uh, 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 you know, 1,300 or something. Uh, that can um, yeah, enable them to do better part design if they know what's going on in the process. And I'm happy that in aerospace, the process chain is a bit longer, so we could do these simulations. So in automotive production or a development chain where you have two years from the first idea to the first production, Usually, we don't have the time for, for doing this process-dependent property simulation. And uh, with that, I will thank you, and thank you for listening, and yeah. Thanks for this great presentation, which is uh, open for discussion. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Uh, you said that uh, your your controller, your self-control simulation takes quite some time because you have a small time step. So you have the same time step for all three solvers? Yes. And which one is is causing the problem to take so long? Which one would you... The mechanical one. Right, okay. Uh, because uh, we, 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 we... The mechanical one is uh, sorry. something like... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you for that question. Um, the mechanical solver is uh, the reason for that. Uh, in my case, I decided to, to use implicit and um, to, to, to enlarge the time step. Um, so in implicit, in every time step, you have to build up the, the matrices. And um, the time step needs to be small enough. Um, uh, be, uh, the, the mechanical time step is the leader. So it says, OK, now call the thermal one, now call the electric one. And if the mechanical one is large, then the other ones aren't called. So we need a small mechanical one just to call the other one. So maybe we should talk on an, or discuss a different uh, coupling scheme for, for my application. It's not that broad, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yes, please. I'll come around. <laughs> A very simple question. Why do you need this perforation? Yeah. <laughs> well, I do not need it, um, but it's maybe a feature for the process designer to influence the current flow and with that influence later where the heat is generated into the part to ensure that the heat is or the temperature is homogeneous. If we don't need it, I think things are easier. But we could simulate with that. Uh, we can check if this perforation is, is on a good spot or not, in case we need it. Because we have um, shape blanks. They are not rectangular. They are more or less arbitrary. And if you place these perforations on some spots, you may can do something good to your temperature profile or to your temperature distribution. 
thank you again. Are there more questions? Online audience? Okay, well then, thank you again for this great presentation. And our next speaker is, if I'm not mistaken here, Maximilian Kaiser from the University of Paderborn in cooperation with the Hegemann um, company. And uh, he's a research employee, so I'm guessing you're pursuing the PhD thesis. And um, the title of his talk will appear in just a second, well, it's already here. Isothermal hot forming for uh, of titanium sheet metal from parameter identification to customer parts. Stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my talk on isothermal hot forming of titanium sheet metal from parameter identification to customer parts in numerical simulation with Alice Diner. My name is Maximilian Kaiser, as uh, mentioned a few seconds ago, from University of Paderborn, and I am uh, working also together with Matthias in this research project at Tistruck. And in cooperation with Hegemann, um, back in the days, we set it up um, a pretty well working isothermal hot forming simulation for aerospace applications and aerospace industries. Our aim at Hegemann here is the permanent optimization to achieve better customer parts, so the optimization of the processes on the shop floor in the end. The challenge in aerospace industries is that we often have to deal with pretty complex parts, it's not standard parts, and uh, the second uh, thing is, and this is what um, Dr. Maya mentioned this morning, is that we have pretty strict demands in aerospace industries, so we can't do anything um, we are maybe able to uh, perform, so here we need to um, cover this. The solution for us at Hegemann is a combination of extensive in-house parameter identification and numerical simulation for our Hegemann internal isothermal hot forming simulation based on Alice Diner. Uh, this I would like to present you during the next 25 minutes. So the scope of my today's talk is um, why numerical simulation in aerospace industries this is then followed by the model setup and the in-house parameter identification. Then I would like to show you our verification and validation, first on a te technological specimen, then on a component-like specimen. The component-like specimen is shown on the slide on the right side. It's a cross-cup. Um, I will go on, uh, I will explain deeper later on. Yeah, and then there's a short summary and outlook. Um, summary of our simulation approach and our simulation results and the outlook why Alice Diner also is uh, taking in future at uh, Hegemann. So, why numerical simulation in aerospace industries? That's a question. Um, for this, I took this iceberg graphic. I don't hope that the planes will meet this one, but um, for us, it's, it's a good um, visualization. So, we have First of all, what we really know often are the drawing requirements by our customers. So here often the question is, is forming the right technology? In um, aerospace industries, um, state of the art is often to mill something. So you have a huge block and then you mill your part out of it. So the first question is, if you have a part which the customer wants to have, um, what are the drawing requirements and is hot forming from Hegemann the solution here? And the answer in the most cases for thin walled parts is yes, it is. Then the th second um, point here is the drawing ratio. It's over the waterline. You can find out uh, in state of the art what's the drawing ratio of our parts. You can calculate it easily by some um, analytical equations. But for special materials like titanium, you don't find it in state of the art. So this um, drawing ratio is one point which might be over the waterline. Oh, need to go in this direction. Might be over the waterline, but often isn't. It's often below. And then, why numerical simulation aerospace industries? There are two more situations. First is the material behavior. We don't know really how the material behaves in our process. Um, we know it maybe from the shop floor, but for our special customer products, it's often not that visible. Also, the materials are changing in thickness um, or in grades, in titanium, grade two, three, five, and so on. The 6.4 is a grade five in uh, aerospace applications. And then we have the geometric behavior, for example, springback issues and so on. Their simulation can support us to um, predict our 
uh, order to, to develop uh, better formed parts. I would like to go shortly, uh, or I would like to explain shortly the hot forming or deep drawing, uh, how we handle it at Hegemann. We're starting with a coated semi-finished product. In this presentation today, I'm talking about the titanium 6-4 alloy. It's, uh, we have a lubricant on it. Then this uh, semi-finished product is getting, or our near net shaped um, blank is getting in our, into our isothermal heated tools. We have temperature ranges between 25 degrees Celsius up to 850 degrees Celsius. So we are not in the process Matthias mentioned in the, in the, in the talk before. Uh, we are lower because it's another process here that uh, is important to mention. Then the blank is heated up to uh, the certain temperatures we applied part is formed and in the end we have our formed part here, it's our uh, component-like specimen, the cross cup. This for a background. So which numerical approach do we follow at Hegemann? I think this is uh, a known graphic from uh, many of you if you're working with Alistaina. But uh, at Hegemann we are following this um, numerical approach because it's, it enables us to predict our customers with um, complex parts and um, the customer knows if we follow this numerical approach he will get the best results he can achieve. The basic for the numerical approach is the modeling approach here down. So we need to define what material do we have, what contacts do we uh, define. This is a basic. Everything followed by this um, shows us uh, how many effort we need to have to fill in those material cards. Here in Alistana you have lots of different cards and the complexity is uh, pretty different. So you need to uh, check which material you have, how do you want to model your, uh, model your material. Then we have the parameter identification to fill in the modeling approach with numbers, with um, material behavior. And after this step, the, so after the um, first stage, you can jump into the second stage and check if your model is working. This is a verification on a technological specimen. Here you can fit, you can turn around at some uh, different points and adjust your model. If this is done, you don't change anything in your model anymore, so you can jump directly to the third stage. It's a validation on a component-like specimen to check if other geometries, other boundary conditions from the real process, so typically not into the simulation because the model is set it up still, um, you can check how the model behaves. And after this stage, um, it's the final stage at Hegemann, we know that the numerical simulation for our customers will get the best results and that the results we obtain out of the simulations are right and we can go with this onto in, in our production and implement it into our daily work. So let me start with the modeling approach. How do we model our um, hot forming process? First, I'd like to start with the contact definition. Here we are using, because it's uh, forming, we're using shell elements, so not solids. For our tools, we're using the Belochki Linsai element form 2 from Alistina. Um, for the blanks, the fully integrated element form 16. The integration rule is a Gauss-Lobato integration. And the element size we have is 1 to 1.5 millimeter. But here um, I need to say that this is for the uh, models I will show you. Of course, the element size is in the end a function of our special application on our uh, geometry and so on. Also on our preciseness we want to have. And for the thermal element formulation, we're using the thermal thick shell as mentioned by some Alistair tutorials back in the days. Um, why am I telling this? The modeling approach leads us to different situations. So out of the modeling approach, we need to um, decide what parameters to evaluate. And here in this contact card, we're using the contact forming surface to surface um, with the thermal add-on. We see some here green highlighted um, values we need to find out. This is, for example, the friction. This is the shearing and, for example, down here, it's a, 
um, heat transfer over a gap or um, the special or the, the most important one here is the HTC, which you need to find out for uh, either thermal or general hot forming simulations. On the right side of this uh, slide, you see then our model. We have a punch here in yellow, a die and a binder, so typical setup for deep drawing, and the blank and cup in blue. Uh, it's a little, I, I think you can see it. Um, here, it's, here it's inside. The movement of the die is in, in a um, one side actuated press, always top to down, and the blank holder force actuates the opposite way. For the material cards, it's looking um, also pretty important because um, in this you need to decide what are your input parameters for your material. And we're using the material card 36, so the Bala, based on Bala uh, 89, with the add thermal expansion for thermal expansion of our blanks. Then the MUD thermal isotropic, there's a defined the Conduction, and here's a little mistake in this. It's not the convection, it's the heat, heat capacity because convection is an Allerstein, a boundary condition in uh, the end. And uh, I'm sorry for this little mistake. Um, and for the rigid bodies, because they aren't really important, um, they're just um, shape defining. We're using the MUD20 rigid bodies. The solver is right now the LS uh, run R12. Maybe we're changing, it always depends on our uh, support communications with Alice Diner, which one is right now the best. So we're having a look and checking um, to the newer versions uh, if we can use them, if they are comparable to our uh, latest um, version we used and where we validated our simulation model. This is pretty important because if something changes in the solver, it's uh, also changing, might change something in the results in the end. And here also in green highlighted again, some values you need to implement. It's the density, the Young's modulus, the Poisson ratio, uh, standard in every um, material card. Important here is we're using the hardening rule nine, where you have a temperature and strain rate dependent flow curve, which we, which we can, uh, what we can evaluate at Hegemann. And we have R values here as well as the M parameter which I can't show really right now. And in the input deck, we are using, uh, this is our, how our input deck looks like in the beginning. We set it up this way that we have our parameters and parameter expression to ensure that some mistakes by users um, at Hegemann don't, uh, are getting too deep into our um, basic simulation model. So here we ensure that the simulation is running even uh, with different users in the end. There's also some explanations down. So we try to set up and ensure that Hegemann always delivers the same results by different users, which is, um, yeah, some, some kind of identity because it's aerospace industries here and pretty important. As mentioned in two sessions from Matthias and from Thomas Meyer, um, always the um, operation procedure is important. In this hot forming, we have four operation steps. First is the positioning, then we close our tools, so the die is right now here. We heat up our specimen and our blank to a certain temperature, as in the real process. Then there's the forming um, and deep drawing, and in the end, the cooling and spring back to um, correlate reality with simulation results. If you wouldn't have this cooling inside, your specimen would be at your temperature, maybe 500 degrees or 400 degrees, and then thickness and diameters and so on are not, uh, not right anymore. This you need to uh, ensure. And again, those are not solids. It's just a vis visualization by Alice pre-post. Um, not that there are some questions later on. So let us come to the parameter identification we do at Hegemann. Um, at Hegemann, we're having a really advanced in-house um, parameter identification or testing center where we can um, perform different tests in-house on a really um, high accuracy. Uh, all parameters can be evaluated up to 850 degrees Celsius, so high temperature range here. And with this, you nearly uh, can apply any uh, forming, deep drawing procedure you want. So first thing is we can evaluate or uh, determine flow curves at Hegemann for different strain rates, different temperatures, and um, 
this in a normal tensile testing machine. We are having an own friction test stand with a stripe pulling test. So also the friction is um, evaluated in-house at Hegemann. We have our uh, forming test, our cupping um, tool, and our cross-cup tool as shown. So our technological specimen and our um, component-like specimen, we can produce in-house and test um, pretty fast um, our results and our simulation model. And then we have, so here we had the mechanical parameters here, where we have the thermal parameters like the HTC, so heat transfer coefficient, and the emissivity. These are not all test stands. Um, at Hegemann, we have many more. For example, Springback spring tools are there in cooperation with the university. Um, a hot Nakajima test stand was built, and so on. And we're still working on increasing our testing capacities. With this, I would like to show you one test stand, um, which wasn't shown on the slide before, and that's pretty interesting right now. So. We, we are having also a convection coefficient test stand because convection is also taken into account at elevated temperature forming or hot forming. Here we see a, ah, sorry. Here we can see this test stand. We heat up a titanium plate by induction to our several temperatures. In this case, we heated it up to 800 degrees and then it's cooled down just by radiation and convection, so no conduction. This can be seen in this diagram. Here we have our blank temperature over cooling time. In red you see the experiment and in blue the simulation. First then the um, red curve is cooling down pretty fast and slower. And um, yeah, so the red curve you can't see, that's good because what we used, we used LS Dyna for inverse simulation, inverse calculation. So it's also a part of our parameter identification in the end. Um, and what we're doing is then we're changing in LS Dyna, we're building up our model like in reality. And then what we're doing is we're just turning at this parameter, it's the H, it's uh, the convection coefficient. And with this and of course the knowledge of radiation, um, which is uh, still implemented here by our testing lab uh, on this emissivity <laughs> test stand, you are able to get these curves where you can see that the red and the blue line are uh, pretty well overlapping and uh, matching. So what we see is then that for the heat transfer um, or how I call it, heat flow coefficient um, over blank temperature, um, we see that uh, in the beginning the convection is mu much more pronounced than the radiation. Then at 150 degrees it's uh, constant at a range roughly below 20 watt per square meter Kelvin. But radiation is heating up pretty fast, so radiation is then at higher temperatures, the more pronounced effect of loss. This is important on the one hand to um, design our process, on the other hand to uh, ensure that our um, simulation model is working or running in the right manner. Now we're after the um, parameter identification, it's followed by the verification on a technological specimen. And on this slide, we can see our forming tool. It's our hot forming tool. Um, at the bottom, here is the binder. Here's the die, and the punch is below our specimen, which is right now placed in the middle. And to verify, to make the verification of our temperature distribution in our blank, we drilled into a 100 diameter um, blank with one millimeter thickness. We drilled holes with 0.6 millimeters to stick some thermocouples inside and measure the temperature at different positions inside our blank at a, in a closed tool. Um, the thermocouple T1 is here at 10 millimeter depth in between the binder and uh, the binder and the die. The second one at 25 millimeters in between the radius of punch and of die and the third one is um, in the middle of the blank, so we have different ways of um, heating. T1 is mostly heated up by HTC. T2 is heated up by conduction into the material, and as Matthias mentioned, uh, titanium doesn't like to... Uh, uh, the the, the um, conductivity in titanium is not that high, so the middle ter uh, thermocouple here, TE3, is just heated up by radiation and convection in the end. And the results are shown on this slide. You see the blank temperature here over holding time 
In red, you see the experiment, and in blue, you can see the simulation results. After placing the, the, the specimen or the blank inside our tools, there's a handling time here of roughly 10 seconds. We are closing our tool, and then the holding time starts. So the simulation shows, or also the experiment, that T1 is heating up pretty, pretty fast in roughly eight seconds. Um, to, to our set temperature, T2 is heating up a little slower, and T3 is heating up, um, yeah, it, it doesn't even reach the maximum temperature after sec 60 seconds, so pretty, pretty slow here. But what we can see in the end is that the simulation and experimental results are fitting pretty well. So here we have uh, nearly no uh, deviation between here also. Here we have little deviations, but it's just 30 Kelvin in the middle of our part where in the end no real plastic deformation occurs because it's the bottom of our um, cup in the end and that's um, totally okay and you see how good the tests here perform for HTC emissivity and on our convection test stand. With this verification we can go to the validation of the component like specimen and here we have our cross cup and how do we validate the model, of course, with the standard parameters like temperature distribution, um, also thickness again, um, Mayer and minor strain. But here I would like to highlight one uh, pretty interesting and unique test stand, Hegemann AG and my department, the, um, depart or the chair of automotive lightweight design from University of Paderborn. Um, build up a test stand and it's a unique high temperature Nakajima test stand with a temperature range up to 850 degrees as everything at Hegemann, and a temperature distribution with just plus minus 10 degrees Celsius or Kelvin uh, for, for the engineers. Um, here we see it's, it's, it's a convection oven with the tool inside. It's a little small. Okay, we have here the binder and the die, the punches in between, and then we can push um, with a 100 millimeter diameter um, punch through this material and see our um, damage curves in the end. And here I would like to show you how precise Alice Diner is in the end really at Hegemann. Okay, perfect, thank you. Here we have a chosen temperature one for the titanium 64 alloy, beta is 1.84 millimeters, uh, beta is, so the drawing ratio is 1.84, sorry. And what we did, we performed simulation and real experiments and we implemented our forming limit curves into the simulation and on this slide we see that at a depth of 60 millimeters in both cases a crack occurs here in the real form part, really S shaped and the results in simulation are looking nearly the same. They are also a little S shaped. Um, in, yeah, you can't imagine maybe, um, but, but you see uh, the horizontal um, line here and also here and it's uh, directly the place or, or the time where the crack occurs. Uh, on the right side then you see your forming limit diagram with major strain uh, over minor strain and then you see that some elements are, um, that some elements failed. This is pretty important because now we know that this temperature range one uh, is uh, where is it? Okay, that this temperature range one is not the right one for our customer parts because it would simply fail into our tests. What we then did is we implemented a second, uh, or we started a second simulation with uh, other temperature range. And here you see the difference here. Yeah, it's not that much difference in temperature between those two uh, cups, but you see the result um, and the result is talking for itself. It's showing what it's, what's possible with titanium hot deep drawing at Hegemann. We see here also again the numerical forming result with FLC and the real forming result. At a depth of 60 millimeters, we're able to form a functional no cracked part and also the FLC or uh, FLC here, the FLD here, shows that the forming is possible with this drawing ratio at this temperature range and this helps us to perform better customer parts in the end. So let me summarize my talk today. Um, there are three main points I would like to mention again. 
First of all, at Hegemann, we're having a great in-house testing center. We are able to make advanced parameter identifications up to 850 degrees by our own immediately if we would like to um, have this, um, yeah, this, uh, this parameters from other um, batches, from other custom parts, from other materials. We are able to perform them in-house. We know what's behind our values. This is all for mechanical as well as for thermal parameters. Second of all is that Hegemann hot forming simulation is uh, advanced right now. First of all, we have validated simulation models with high accuracy of the applied models for hot and then of course also for cold forming in the end. So we are able to perform um, the simulations with LS Dyna together from the parameter identification to our customer simulations um, with this high accuracy in this validated models. And the last point here in the summary is that um, we can do advanced process evaluation. This is what I'd like to show with the cross cup a few slides ago. First of all, we can anal analyze influencing parameters easily with LS Dyna. Then followed by hot forming process. So how's the outlook um, of my today's talk for Hegemann simulations? First of all, we're having a permanent expansion of testing capacities for better process understanding. It helps us to perform better custom parts and uh, to understand how the material really behaves. Then we have permanent customer-related optimization of simulation models. Of course, with every simulation of our customers, we're learning. Yeah? And we're using this knowledge then and um, mirroring it back to our uh, current simulation model. Of course, then with our modeling approach, we're starting and testing if the changes in simulation are then correct or not. As mentioned today, we are researching uh, for sustainable process change. The change um, there, Alice Diner and the simulation at all is helping us pretty well because um, with the simulation we can save time, cost, material, and in the end we can uh, have sus more sustainable processes because, for example, temperature ranges are dependent uh, or important for our sustainability. Our waste of material, which isn't important for our customer parts but necessary for the forming, this all can be seen in the simulations before producing the first, the second, and the third tool. This is uh, really beneficial in the end. And the last point is that, uh, of course, we have further implementations of Alice Steiner in Hegemann, as um, told from, uh, Mr. from Dr. Thomas Meyer this morning. Uh, he gave an overview over the um, implementations of Alice Steiner and simulations in daily business of Hegemann. So thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Thank you, Maximilian, for this great presentation, which is also open for discussion. Are there any questions? No? So maybe I have one. Uh, when you measured the convection uh, coefficient, uh, did you also um, measure this on a cup-shaped thing, so the, the wall is actually um, vertical? We hadn't um, measured, it, it depends a little on the testing setup, so it yeah. was um, flat, but the specimen was so small that we also hadn't uh, had a difference between upper and lower, also, also top and bottom side, uh, because of different convection, so uh, we said it's um, nearly the same uh, convection for horizontal walls and for uh, flat surfaces. Um, that's also a function, because in, in reality, in the real forming process, it's not that your part is laying then they're like like this and standing there, it's yeah. often flipped around, it's sometimes laying like this inside, and um, so there the simulation might go too deep inside, to yeah. more, would be too academic because it's not really meeting the, um, yeah, the, the real process in the end um, on the shop floor. Yeah, yeah, so but bottom line, there was not much difference then when, from... It from... was, was uh, the same, we couldn't, we, well, we just have one millimeter thick titanium, oh, okay. yeah. was, um, no, no change, we checked it because in, in uh, the hot forming, Sorry, from understand, I think it's inside. Yeah. <laughs> there was, there was a div uh, the difference between top and bottom, but uh, we hadn't seen this in our measurements. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Nothing? Okay. Then that's thank you again. <laughs>
Yeah, I want to start with my presentation. I'm Johannes Buhl from the BTU of Cottbus Senftenberg. Um, yeah, Cottbus Senftenberg is uh, UTC um, point two, I think, for many, many years. And um, now it's a it's a moment we we build up a Chesco. Perhaps you 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 know this um, big research um, center, which is which should be built up. And there is a um, there is a Another part, which which is F Merck fast manufacturing processes for for um, hybrid electrical um, vehicles in the airplane, uh, it it will take some time. I think um, it was only 600 megabytes, and <laughs> <laughs> perhaps it is too much for this laptop. Okay, this is at the moment it is. Um, it is under construction, and and we have an interim hall there. But everything is in connection with Rolls Royce, and I cannot say too much about this. Therefore, I I make my talk with not this hot hot topic of the of the airplane industry. I use some some simple examples from from our chair, um, and I want to say on the slides. Um, I mentioned in the in the footnote um, that they um, that they have a lot of colleagues which are included in this work and therefore um, they are found in the in the slides directly. Okay, it seems to work. Let me have a short look if I can move this point here too. Yes, fine. Um, I have a, a short outline too. Um, at first, a short introduction. What is additive manufacturing with a wire arc? And then, what are the basics of the wire arc um, modeling? Then I come to the comparison of numerical strategies and um, convergence analysis. Then I want to focus on four welding path strategies and and come with five fixation strategies. Then I want to show you a rule-based path identification law. It makes LS9 a little bit um, intelligent or more intelligent. And then, in the end, I come to some examples from um, simulation of AM parts. Okay, our wire arc additive manufacturing process is is in this way we have here a wire this wire um, there we have an arc and then we have the deposition on a substrate we heard about the the advantages of this process i don't want to say much more i think hegemann um, showed us some nice um, some nice parts too um, therefore I want to start directly with the idea. I think many of you have the same idea, perhaps. In future, we want to start and include a CAD model, make a decomposition of this CAD model, and then we want to come to um, to a slide to a slicer. The slicer should be somehow intelligent, it should look, um, should I follow the contour or should I make a stupid um, um, slice in that direction? And then we come to the problem that if we have some corners, we will have voids and um, yeah, we should fill these voids, otherwise we have a lack in our material in the end. And then we come to our big point for today, the FEM process and the um, SPH process. And then we have here a loop, you see it in red, and in the end we want to give it to the, to the robot to manufacture it. And we need the simulation to calculate the shrinkage, to, uh, the distortion, the cracks and the residual stresses. Now at first we start with a, with a decomposition of, of our parts. Here is this, a nice example, it's a cup, it is decomposed in into three subparts, which should be manufactured separately. Then here a, a rib structure, and then a, um, a, t a curvature, or a curved tube. This here is um, an interesting example because we can manufacture it layer-wise only in that direction, or we can choose adaptive layers with different thicknesses, and then we can manufacture it 
manufacture it without um, start and stop points. Okay, let us come to some um, basics for the for the warm modeling. At first, we need a heat source. I think a lot of you know the Goldeck heat source. It's very famous, and we uh, adjust this heat source parameters for our TPSI 5000 of the Fronius. Then we have a lot of material parameters. All the material parameters should be temperature dependent. I think it's clear if you want to um, model. Um, um, an additive manufacturing process and here I want to um, put my focus on the convection and radiation coefficients. This is very important for us. We, we get it to know now when we simulate titanium 6.4 that it is very, very, very important that we have the right coefficient between 300 and, and um, 600 degree because it will um, cause us a lot of prob problems if it is not right when we want to um, simulate the residual stresses in the end. Not for the phase composition, but for the residual stresses. Now we have our Goldig parameter. We pick one, one point and look if the, if the temperature history is fine. Yes, we come that it's fine. And then we, we want to build up the model. I want to say some basics. Here it is a simple block which is welded on a support plate. At first, the uh, mechanical contact is established for the complete um, AM process then. We, we um, start the, the um, thermal properties at a certain temperature and the, after this we start the mechanical properties and the, and, the, um, and the thermal contact properties are defined time dependent because we know when we come to the next rope and there is another problem or uh, um, another point which is very very important, we have convection and radiation, and when we have an, an activated material, then we have no convection and radiation to the, to the, um, to the surface um, where we have direct contact. Therefore, if we have um, yeah, this, um, this radiation and this convection must be put off. Okay, a lot of this stuff is done automatically with the solver and this is a point where, why we use LS Dyna because it's very comfortable. Then we prove our, our thermal activation of the material properties and here we see that if we weld two ropes next to each other or we, we, we weld the first rope and then we active the, the next, the next um, contact thermal contacts, that means um, there is a, a temperature flow. It's clear, but why is there a temperature flow? Because we have a ghost property. And I want to, I want to say you something about these ghost properties in, in the next, um, in the next slides. Now the laptop is a li little bit, not so fast. Um, <laughs> Here we, we have, a, we, I pick a rope in, in the big box. Here you saw the temperature distribution and, and after the temperature comes some stresses over the time. And now we come to our next big topic. And in this topic, um, I want to say something about the numerical strategies and the convergence analysis. Now, AM simulation, Perhaps it is easy in a program where everything is done automatically and you don't know what you really do. But um, in LS Dyna you, you must know a little bit more. Um, at first you, you look about your mesh because it should survive thousands of beats and thousands of, of, of thermal, thermomechanical um, cycles. Then you should choose an implicit or an explicit solver. You can use a hybrid code. You can use fully um, coupled thermomechanical solvers. And you can use something which is, which is commonly known, but then you will get problems because you have some ghost properties. The so ghost properties um, are in the material which is not active at the moment. And in this ghost material, there you should use a low elastic modulus, a high heat capacity and, and a low thermal conductivity. Then you have a, 
uh, less physical influence. But if you want to accelerate your simulation and if you want to have um, um, less numerical instabilities, you should use, for example, a high um, elastic modulus, and this will affect your simulation. And therefore, I have done this, or we have done this, um, the simulation to see it. At first, um, a short mark about the meshes. Here you see tetrahedral meshes with a big mesh size, with a, with a better mesh size, and then hexahedral meshes. Um, and then we use explicit solver with a very big time step, an explicit solver with a smaller time step, and then an implicit solver with a quite big time step. And then we come to the conclusion this explicit um, solver for the mechanical part needs ex uh, nearly the same time as the implicit, but the implicit show much, 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 much better and re reliable and more reliable um, results on the residual stresses in the end. When we look in the, in the um, thermal history, we, we must not try to um, build it up with an explicit solver. It doesn't make sense when you have here a big cooling, um, a big cooling time, and when you simulate bigger parts, you need hours to cool it down. Therefore, we use implicit all the time. When we look in the stresses on the plate, there we will see explicit and implicit. It is nearly the same. When we look in the ropes, the implicit shows a lot of stresses, the explicit solver not. And this is dependent on the time step, but if you want to be time efficient, then you should not um, use the explicit solver. Here is a short summary. Use the fully coupled implicit thermomechanical um, solver. It is only one minute more than if you calculate at first the, the, um, the, the thermal history and then the mechanical history. So then, if you look in the time step in the mesh and in the mesh size, there you will see when you use only the implicit, there is some variation, for sure, it must be a variation. And we come to the conclusion that it makes sense to use a mesh, um, a step size of 0 0.25 um, seconds for our case. And you should adapt your, your step size here. Um, and if you come to the cooling part, you should make a very, very big step size. And don't use a very fine mesh. This will cause you a lot of problems and instabilities if you have a long simulation time. Um, here you can see that if you use a rough mesh and a, a big time step, then you need more time as if you use a rough mesh and a middle time step and this because the, the big time step leads to some um, numerical instabilities. Um, therefore, please use a time step which has something to do with your mesh size. Okay, here is um, one suggestion for the, for the solver. It is, um, it is an old version of LS Diner. This investigations come from an old version um, of LS Diner. Now I want to show you something about welding path strategies and fixation strategies. Now there are different methods like the bidirectional method or the unidirectional method, the crosswise and the spir spiral methods um, where we, how we can, oh, wie kriege ich denn die jetzt gestartet? Um, where we can um, see the where we can see the temperature distribution now for the different um, pass strategies, and then we can compare it. And and see in the end that the support plate will bend, and there will, will come something like a deflection ring, and in the deflection ring you can see a lot of residual stresses and plastic deformations, and you will see that everything is destroyed somehow. Um, and now we come to the idea, is it not possible to use different fixation strategies to, um, 
to overcome this bending stuff. Here you have four points where the, where the support is fixed very, very hard here in the strategy number five. You fix it only in set direction and in the middle of this, of this plate you have a completely fixed node. Okay, when you look in the results, here are some lines, and at these lines, you um, you can see here the uh, the distortion, and you see the fixation number five. It is nearly nothing, and for the different other lines, the fixation five is the best fixation. That means you should not you should not fixate your plate really with um, a, a screw or something like this. This would be very this uh, very bad for the for the AM process. You should only put some uh, some yeah some crypts that it can that, that that it can move and elongate, and should fix it only in the middle. And then you can see here the strategy five. There you have nearly no deflection, and you have the the lowest residual stresses. Yeah, and here you can see the. The uh, evaluation of the residual stresses um, in in curves again. Let us come to a very, from my side, a very important um, topic. It is a rule-based path identification. Um, therefore, we we use a geometry with ten layers, only a wall with ten layers, and we and we cut the wall here in in five parts. That means in the end we have 50 separate parts. And we want to decide during the simulation which part should be manufactured at the next step. We don't want to make a big optimization and, and calculate hundreds or thousands of, of complete simulations. No, we want to st stop the simulation after we weld one small rope or part of the rope and then we want to um, proceed the simulation. Therefore, we make a coupling with MATLAB and start with MATLAB LS Dyna. And we make an, an evaluation of the temperature distribution. And based on the temperature distribution, we find out where is, the, where is the lowest point of the temperature on the surface. And then in this area, we, we put the next um, um, part of the rope. That is that is um, shown here, that we can adjust here in five steps, one, one rope, and then we, we make a second case that we make an, a break of 10 seconds between each step, and then we make this calculation. And it is so that we define the first layer, there is nothing intelligent, but then we come with our MATLAB investigation, look in the, in the, on the um, sur surface temperature, find out that here, for sure that here is the lowest temperature there we we put our next um, our next element we make our temperature analysis put here our next element and so on that we come in the end to the conc oh no in the end we have the same welding time we have the same temperature the same overall temperature for sure but when we look in the temperature peaks we can see that we can reduce the temperature um, difference. And this was our aim. And we can, in the case one, we can reduce the temperature peaks for 22 percentage and for the case two, for 25 percentage. Okay. The next topic is the path optimization with SPH methods. Perhaps you know SPH methods. We saw some some examples in in the morning, and we use this method to to um, simulate the AM process. Here you see the drops, the hot drops, which come down and are solidified, and here with different um, drop rates. Okay, let us come to some examples. Here is our cup. We we weld this cup. It is a cup of aluminum, and um, yeah, as I already mentioned, um, it is a Fronius um, heat source, um, like Hegemann. Hegemann, um, it, I think it is nearly the same. Then we turn the table and weld the, the cup handles. 
and we have done for sure the same in the simulation. We, we weld this cup. I have not in mind how many layers these are. I think nearly 100 layers. Um, here you can see the temperature profile in the end directly after the stop. Here you can see the the, um, um, the final um, displacement and here you can stop. This is not easy because the definition of the heat source and the definition of the um, of the mesh, everything changed um, during one cycle. But we have done it and and in the end you can see here um, the residual stresses which occur after cooling the model of the of the um, weld bead you can see here and um, yeah if you if you want to see something more about this investigation you can look in this uh, publication which is already done and another perhaps very interesting topic is if you look in tools the tools are stringent with with some rings this is normal and we come to the idea can we not um, put some AM ropes on the on the outer um, surface of the tube then they will shrink because of the temperature they will shrink and then we have a reinforcement of the tool and the very bad um, ten, um, tension um, tensile stresses in the in the tool will be reduced and it is very simple and to and to make some rings for the reinforcement it's very hard because you need a very high geometrical accuracy you you have to mount it very carefully, otherwise it will, it will not be, it, it, it is not possible. But welding it is, it is easy. Therefore we make some investigations, is it right? We make some, um, we measure some residual stresses, we come to the conclusion that our model is okay. We compare the, the, the VAM reinforcement with the conventional reinforcement, it seems to be nearly the same and then we come um, in the WAM simulation with different um, velocities and see here that we should make a velocity, we should weld for our example with a velocity of 30 millimeter per second and then we have a very nice um, reinforcement. There are a lot of other parameters which are investigated in this study and again if you, if you if you have um, um, a lot of interest, you can look in these publications and then you can, can find a lot of details about the simulation and about the benefit of, of these examples. And now I want to, I'm very, interesting, uh, I'm very interested in your questions and yeah. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, also, this talk is open for discussion. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. I thought so. <laughs> um, just regarding this, this uh, picture there, you said you have this, what was it called, RPPI, whatever. It's this, this very, I mean, when you do the new spots, the new volumes, then you apply again the heat source or Goldeck heat source again, and in the direction, it's just you know which direction to take, or is it also uh, described by your MATLAB code? It is, it is by the MATLAB code. So you then you say, okay, this is my next block. I have to heat up, and it's colder on the left hand side, so I start there. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, this this was exactly the aim um, to to make it completely in this way. Um, this. Uh, the state of the art in this publication was that we have it predefined, that we have one complete rope in this direction, the next rope completely in this direction. But in the end we want to make it flexible, that we have it for one rope part, for that, that the simulation can, can, um, can uh, that the simulation has this choice to use the, in this direction or in the other direction. Are there more questions? Okay. <laughs> Coming around. Maximilian. Uh, 
Um, yeah, uh, short question. Um, is the MATLAB code um, totally integrated in your simulations or do you need to always check and restart and restart um, your simulations in LS, LS Run or do you have it, uh, is, is a MATLAB script uh, then parallel running to your uh, simulation? Yeah, for sure. We, we, we start the MATLAB code one time and then the MATLAB starts the LS Diner and make and adjust the complete input file. Also this was uh, the idea of the um, project that, that, that the MATLAB generates the input file and, and read out the output file. Hmm. I also have a question. <laughs> you first. <laughs> Also, a question to our side. Uh, did someone know if plot compress also compresses temperature data? Because then we could rescue our laptop for <laughs> all of these videos. Because I think nobody needs, let's say, eight or 16 digits for the temperature. And maybe that could, could help to reduce the amount of data. I can imagine that you have a lot of data uh, in your runs, even for that, let's say, rather simple construction like these bricks or... Or you have how, how how large is the data you store for one run? Um, you speak now about the the last step or of about the bended tube. For example, this one we see now. For this one, I have it not in mind. But for this um, bended tube, it was um, 60 gigabyte. It it, <laughs> it it was a lot for for our PC. Yeah. I was wondering when you introduce, uh, so you stop the welding here and then uh, maybe you go here, here and there, you introduce interfaces everywhere. Is that from a stability point of view later on uh, really beneficial or is it like coping with the distortion from the thermal effects, uh, might this not be the, the smaller evil? So when, I mean, when you, so the first layer was you run it through and then the second one you go at a position where you have the lowest temperature and then you find yeah. other positions. So every time you kind of start the weld elsewhere, you introduce an interface uh, when you connect your new material to the old one. So I, I would assume you have more interfaces created compared to if you just go on a straight line. No, no. Um, we make, ah, perhaps I should say it, we, we make a short, um, a, a small trick for sure. We, we define the complete model before one time and say, okay, the idea is to define one complete model, divide it in very, in, in a lot of sub models, then you have sub models and then you can connect it with, with include or with, with other methods and, and put it on the right time, time order. That means everything is defined on the, the simulation technique more from a physical standpoint that you know the, um, the material is, is joined better if you weld it in one line. Ah, yes for sure. Yeah. For sure. It, it generally you you want to avoid a start and a stop. Yeah. It therefore we make this uh, tube to have only one start and only one stop. It is really stupid to start and stop all the time because it, it causes defects and um, when you start a, a welding rope then um, yeah, it, it grows and in the end you have um, a peak. Yeah. Yes, that you're completely right. <laughs> completely right, yes. So uh, welcome back to our third and final session. We, are, uh, we have a little delay of two minutes but as we are in an intercity hotel I think that's quite okay, so you don't get 25% back. So, um, yeah. Um, so, our next speaker will be Mr. David Koch. He has a PhD in mechanical, no, in continuum mechanics, and his current position is senior project manager at our material competence center in LE, Leinfelden Echterdingen. So, David, it's yours. Yeah, thank you, Matthias, for the kind introduction. Welcome you all to my talk. It's about gizmo and how gizmo can be used for damage and failure uh, prediction. I think that many of you have become into contact with uh, damage and failure in your simulations. And in this, con uh, in this context, 
the keyboard gizmo often comes up and this is exactly what I'm now talking about. So the development of gizmo started about 15 years ago um, and the initial idea was to have a better transition from forming to crash simulation. Um, over time, however, um, Gizmo has proven to be an extremely powerful um, model for damage and failure modeling. So this is why um, it is now used in a wide range of, in a wide variety of situations when damage and failure is, um, is to be simulated. So I will present the, the basic ideas of, of Gizmo and how Gizmo works. Um, I will show some of its features, not all, not, not into detail. And for those of you who are, who are really interest, interested in these details, I would like to recommend our corresponding training course. So before I get into the topic, uh, I would like to say a few words about the group I work in within Dynamo. This, uh, it's the Material Competence Center. Um, we, have, uh, we have customers that, uh, that are asked very frequently about material cards and where to get material cards for the simulations. So finally in 2014, 2015, Dynamo des uh, decided uh, uh, to, to, make some, to make something up, something up uh, ourselves and we want to provide customers uh, with high quality material cards. This is our current team at the MCC, the Material Competence Center. Um, yeah. we, offer, we offer several types of, ten, uh, of testing, like um, tensile tests, compression, puncture, bending tests, for quasi-static, for dynamic, cyclic testing. Um, we also offer uh, component testing. We have three dimensions and mind right now. Yeah, we offer single source parameter identification and we have a direct connection to the Alice Dyna developer team. So and this helps us very often to identify the right settings in some tricky situations. Well, this is a select, uh, selection of our machinery. We have a water jet cutter to extract samples from, from sheet metal. Um, we have a special printer to print the pattern of the afforded DIC on, on samples. Yeah, we have, we have to, to print some black white pattern on the samples that the DIC cameras can um, follow the points on the specimens. Um, we have two DIC systems, one with uh, 5 and one with 12 megapixels. <coughs> and we have also two universal testing machines, one with a 10 kilonewton and one with a 100 kilonewton lo load cell. We have a climatic chamber to condition the samples before, uh, the, before the experiments if necessary. So we, we usually don't use it for steels, but if we have polymers and foams and so on. They are quite sensitive very often to temperature and humidity, so this is why we have this climate chamber. And we have <coughs> for the t uh, dynamic bending tests and, um, on polymers and uh, dynamic compression tests on foams, we have this uh, pendulum. Yeah, recently another colleague has uh, joined our team. Um, yeah, he not only relieves us of um, of work, but he also works extremely precise. And yeah, so this, this benefits the quality of our, also of our test results. Because he can pick up the samples, he can present the samples to the optical measurement system um, for the automatic measurement from all sides. So we are getting a 3D model from all uh, tested specimen. It can place the sample in the testing machine and it finally removes the residues after the testing. Okay, so I think time flies, so let's have a look at uh, Gizmo together. 
why do we need a special damage and failure model? You probably all know that we have already the fail parameter in MAT24 and also in many other materials too. So why not, choose, why not only set a failure value here and we're done? Yeah. In this case, we, will only, we would only see an element gets deleted for at some yeah, typically, typically equivalent plastic strain. And it doesn't matter which, strain, uh, which, which stress state we are in, what, yeah. So we also don't have damage then. So what if we want to also know what, what kind of behavior we have before failure? We want to consider maybe different stress states. <clears throat> or we want to consider damage behavior in a process simulation. So and this is where Gizmo co um, um, comes into place. Uh, maybe let's start with, a defin with some definitions so we all know what we are talking about. I actually use the terms failure and damage um, already. But what do I actually mean? What do I actually mean when I say damage or failure? Let's start with failure. So failure is when we have the f failing of a physical structure of a material. So usually this is a sudden failure and um, the material fails without prior influence on the strength. Then uh, damage. This is what happens before the failure, right? So we have maybe a reduction of the physical strength, like the stress reduction, for example. And typically, this is an uh, incremental evolution. We have some parameter that, is, that evolutes. Um, yeah. And when this parameter reaches a certain value, then we have the coupling. And it re if it reaches another value, we have the failure. So da damage is a more complex model, usually. Um, but we can use Gizmo for both applications. So Gizmo can be damage and failure model simultaneously. So there are several um, approaches to describe failure in finite element method. For example, we can use XFEM, where we have an enriched or extended finite element method, where fractures can be reproduced as discontinuities. On the one hand, with this approach, we don't lose mass or create artificial empty space. Um, moreover, the crack with, uh, width is independent of the element size. We can, only uh, we can also use a simpler approach, which is element deletion. So it's easier to implement. It's quite fast. Um, but in this case, we lose mass and we create artificial empty areas. So we have to keep this, this also in mind. Um, yeah, so maybe a note here. So deleting failed elements is state of the art in many simulation applications right now. OK, so how is damage handled in Gizmo? Let's start with a damage parameter D. We see here the parameter, it starts at the zero, at zero, with for the plastic strain equals zero, and it goes up. And at some point, it reaches a value of one. But when does it reach this value? We have to define, okay, so there's a vertical line. You can't see it here. There's a vertical line here. We have to define a failure strain where this damage parameter should reach the value 1. And then we have another parameter, which I call the, the coupling parameter f, because we want to define where the coupling should start, so where, have we, where we have the damage initi initiation. So we have also to define this value here, where f equals 1. So we have to define another value. And this could be either another strain, this one, a critical strain. Or we could all also use 
the damage parameter and define a critical value for D to, def to define if D reaches this critical value, then we want to be F equals 1. And we also see this in, in the input that we could define either epsilon critical or D critical. We see this later. So now we have the stress coupling. So as long as F is smaller than 1, so in this area, we have no coupling, so stress is not reduced. We have 100% of the stress calculated. And from this point on, we have a decrease of stress until we reach the stress equals 0 when at the point where D equals 1 and the element fails. So this, uh, this is more or less the, the input then we can, uh, how we, the, that helps us to define um, the behavior of gizmo. We have the damage exponent. This value, I also don't like formulas. This, uh, that's why these formulas are gray. So it's not important, you only have to know that we have the damage exponent and with the damage exponent we can define the shape of these curves for D and F. Um, we have another exponent, this is the fading exponent and it defines the shape of the coupling, right? So it's the shape of this curve. So if we set f uh, fading exponent to 1, yeah, it's up here in the formula, if you set it to to 1, then we have a linear decrease here from f equals 1 to d equals 1, but in most cases we use higher exponents. Um, yeah, and finally, as I already said in the last slide, we have decrease, no, it's the same slide, yeah, decrease or ecrit to define the onset of the coupling. So what does this look like on a, on a tensile test? So if we have no coupling, we have here the increase of stress, we reach the necking point, we have necking, and we have sudden failure here for d equals 1. This would be only failure model. But we, and when we apply also the damage model, at a certain point we, we reach f equals 1, we start coupling, and you see the stress is decreased and we go down until we reach the stress of zero right at the moment when the element gets deleted. So this is also maybe interesting information. Uh, your simulations could become more stable if elements are no longer deleted suddenly, but uh, because this may lead to um, pressure waves propagating through your part and this may trigger some further failure in other positions or uh, points where you don't want to see failure right now. So here you can see a little bit the influence of this fading exponent, right? So if you have higher values of the fading exponent, the, the, the coupling is later, stronger, so you have see also almost no change in the, the beginning, and you have almost all the coupling in the last last few steps here. If you have a smaller fading exponent, you have a more linear behavior in the coupling. So now let's talk about stress states. Um, the measure to distinguish different stress states is the triaxiality. Um, which is, uh, it is defined as the negative ratio of the hydrostatic pressure to the equivalent stress. Um, yeah, you can see certain stress states for shells here. On the one end, the left side, at a triaxiality of minus two thirds, we start with biaxial compression. And we are here on the compression side when we have a negative, negative sign here. When we are at, at zero, we have uh, shear, and on the positive side we have tension up to two-thirds where we have the biaxial tension. Um, for shells, triaxiality is restricted right to these uh, values from minus two-thirds um, to two-thirds, but for solids we have no boundaries, so every value is possible. Um, moreover, um, 
Yeah, solid, um, solid elements have another dimension. So we not only have the triaxiality, but we also have the loading parameter to define the stress state. So how do we define um, coupling initiation and failure? You may remember this diagram. And um, in this case, both quantities, quantities are constant. So we have epsilon critical and we have the failure strain up here. And if you apply some proportional loading, which means that during, during the, um, when applying the load, we don't change the triaxiality value, at a certain point, we reach the critical strain, and F equals 1. We have coupling, stress is decreased, and at some point, we reach the failure curve, and D equals 1, and the element gets deleted. Um, similar to non-proportional loading. So now we have a change in triaxiality, but at the moment, we cross the curve, we have F with F equals 1, and here we have D equals 1. But in reality, we don't have constant values, right? So we have some curve, curves that uh, have to be found during calibration. And since we have an incremental accumulation of F and D, coupling now may not start directly on the curve. So if we follow this path here, we almost reach d equals 1, but then we bend over to the right, we cross the critical strain curve, but here in this area, we, don't, we haven't accumulated so much F, so we have to accumulate more plastic strain, and we have to wait a little bit until we reach F equals 1, it's not directly on the curve, right? But we accumulated quite a lot of D, the damage parameter here. So it only needs a little bit more plastic strain and we reach D equals 1 right before we cross the failure curve. So this is due to the incremental um, the definition of the evolution of F and D. It, could, it is also possible, you see, that in, in some areas we have the, the, critical fa uh, the critical strain above the failure curve. So in these areas, we would see brittle failure because at the point where the element fails, we have F still smaller than 1. And um, so in this area, we don't have coupling. Okay, so... This is our standard set for gizmo calibration for shell elements. We have different types of, of, of shapes, so we get the different stress states. Um, and the identification of the hardening curve is an iterative process. Um, up to the necking point, we can do a straightforward uh, conversion of the engineering stress strain curve. And from the necking point, we need, to, uh, we need to extrapolate. Yeah, so as I already said, it's an iterative, uh, iterative process. So with every iteration, we come closer to the stress strain curve, and we change here the extrapolation of the yield curve. But if we only have an agreement here, for a stress strain curve, it might be the case that we have um, different results for the for the strain fields, right? So this is only a necessary but not a sufficient condition to to be sure to have the right material parameters found. So we can see that if we m use more complex material model like material 36, for example, we get a better um, agreement for the strain field. This is an overview, an exemplary overview for a calibration. Um, 
yeah, by fitting the curve for coupling and failure, we finally achieve acceptable, acceptable agreement for all tests here. And a few slides earlier, I talked about linear and nonlinear strain path. And on this graph, you can see the strain path of some integration points from different simulator tests. Although the, uh, par the paths saw roughly as expected, meaning we have the, the shear here in this area, and we have the, 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 the integration points of the biaxial test at this area, we have strongly nonlinear behavior here in the middle, which means we have also a strong coupling. So we can do a shear test and find exactly this point of the failure curve, and we can do a uniaxial tension test and find this curve, this, this, this point here. So it's all coupled, which makes it much more complicated to find a good agreement for all, uh, for all ex experiments, for all specimens at the same, at the same time. This is an overview for the uh, of the calibration of a material card for solid elements. It's from a bachelor thesis, and as, as already mentioned, there's another dimension here besides the triaxiality, um, the loaded parameter. So we have here the triaxiality, and we have also the loaded parameter. So now the failure curve is not, not uh, no more a curve, it's a surface now. Um, yeah. So I'm a little bit short in time. So I go quick over this. So we have another big topic in calibration, which is the mesh dependence. We have to dis distinguish between two phenomena that we see in mesh dependency. We have geometrical mesh dependence. So um, yeah, it, this is simply a consequence of the spatial discretization with finite elements, right? So um, for this dependency, we usually see a convergence if the mesh is fine enough. And on the other hand, on the other hand we have the so-called spurious mesh dependency. And it's a, a consequence of the local continuum mechanics. And it affects the solution only under certain conditions, like uniaxial stress after the necking point. So it's not converging also with a finer mesh. The regular, regularization strategies are intended to tackle the spurious mesh dependency. So how can we handle mesh dependency? This is the visualization of this effect. So for all element sizes, the simulation is evaluated at one point. So let's look here. So at this point, we evaluate all these simulations. We have a 0 0.5 millimeter mesh, and we go up with a mesh size up to 10 millimeters. So on the right side for this, you can see it because it's not drawn here, but we have two elements next to each other here in the middle. Um, yeah, as you can see, the smaller the elements are, the larger we have the, the local strains. And of course, we have uh, strong differences in the, in the strain field, but these differences cannot be avoided due to the partly very large elements. But we can regularize the, the failure by scaling the failure curve depending on the element size. We could not change the, the strain fields, right? So these strain fields are unchanged. But we have this diagram now. And as you can see, with increasing element size, we have a decreasing scaling factor for the, for the failure curve. So we can achieve that we have failure at the same point here. However, this was only the calibration for the element size for a simple tensile test. Uh, to make the regularization more flexible, you can also define gizmo. What should uh, and you can also define in gizmo what should happen in the areas outside of the uniaxial tension. So, this is done classically <coughs> classically with the parameters shear f and biax f. Though. So, um, yeah, with these parameters, it is possible to control how the regular regularization takes place under shear and biaxial loading. Yeah. So both values zero, we have simply a, a multiplication, a scaling of the whole curve with a corresponding parameter. If we set one 
or one or two of these parameters to one, we have here for the shear uh, or the, the, the biax um, loading state, we, do, we don't have coupling here. There's also the possibility to use minus one to get some other behavior and quite new. So there's also, it's also possible now to specify the regularization as a table, of course, depending on the triaxiality. So to return to the beginning and the original idea for the development of Gizmo, this is what a process can, a process can look like in which a first yeah, simulation is done for the forming and then we have a crash simulation in between, we have the mapping with, for example, Envio, what Toga was, uh, uh, will be talking about. Um, yeah. yeah. Damage can also already be calculated here for, for the element size that is used in the crash simulation later on. So this is how the input actually look like, looks like. For a gizmo card, you set the same idea as for your material model that describes the basic behavior of the material. You have to define all these, these curves I talked about. And for those of you who use a, conversion, uh, a version smaller than R11, you still have to use the keyword mod at erosion. Uh, all other users can, uh, are welcome to use a new keyword mod at damage gizmo, which is much clearer and meanwhile already offers a fun new functionalities that are not included in mud at erosion. This finally brings me to the end of my short presentation and uh, uh, about the basic principles of Gizmo. I thank you very much for your attention and maybe we'll have a little time for one or two questions. Thank you. So uh, thank you, David, for your nice talk. It was able to catch up with the uh, delay of the uh, train in front of us. Um, but we still, so we, thanks. So we have time for one question. Um, I think, as I have seen online, is no question. Is there one here in the audience in Berlin? Please feel free, I can run to you. That does not look the case, um, but I have one. Um, when you do a material card calibration, um, how much of these cards are with Gizmo and how many are without? Because me in metal forming, I know we could use it or we can use it, um, but not many do it already. Um, so how is your, how do you see that? Or how, how, how much is the um, faction? Yeah, so, as you already said, it, it, it really depends on the application, right? So when we do crash uh, material cards for, for crash simulation, then we almost every time have the, the, the gizmo card. So we, we almost have 100% gizmo and almost no other failure model um, for, for, for if, if we calibrate damage and failure. But yeah, I think so. Yeah, seventy percent, something like this, would uh, of the cards are with with uh, damage and failure. Yeah, yeah, it's we. I think it's it's a long time ago that we have customers asking about other f damage and failure models. So, Gizmo is what what we are seeing is Gizmo is more or less the standard in this area. I know other customers are using other models like like DM but um, most customers use Gizmo. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, um, thank you for your nice presentation and maybe again some small applause for him. <laughs> and with that, it's a pleasure to announce our next speaker, uh, which is, uh, who is uh, Thomas Klöppel? Please be careful to my old laptop. Um, Thomas holds a PhD in computational mechanics and his current position is a developer of LS Dyna and mostly, oh no, he is responsible for the uh, thermal solver and also for some material models and today he's going to present us one of his newest implementations. So Thomas, good luck. Thank you Matthias. Um, 
Yeah, I'm going to talk about a new material model for uh, continuum, continuous fiber reinforced plastics. Um, I have to say that's really different to as compared to what we have seen this morning. It has a different approach. It has also different focus. And why is that the case? I'll give you an idea about it in, in my motivation. Um, then this material is called uh, 249 crash. Um, I will tell about talk about some of the general properties of it. Then I go into a damage and failure, and again, completely different uh, as compared to what we have just seen about Gizmo. It's not that I don't like equations like everyone else claims. I love them. But there are just not enough or none worth showing in, for this material, I have to admit. That is, so no, no, not much equation here, but not because I dislike them, but they are just none worth mentioning. So I'm a bit sad, but anyways, um, then we'll have a couple of examples, and at the end, I'll, if time allows, I'll try to give you a short summary about it. So the motivation, first of all, why did we do something here? Um, and this was actually motivated by a request from, from Prosa, uh, especially Dr. Michael French came to us, and he brought... Um, University of uh, Kaiserslautern uh, with him basically and ask for some way or some answer to his questions because he wanted to model a material, um, uh, a, mont uh, a composite with a mo woven reinforcement with a thermoplastic matrix material. So that was what they had. Um, and he said, okay, this material is not like, it's relatively ductile, it's not as you would expect it, like we saw this crash box this morning. So everything is completely destroyed. It's relatively nice material. It behaves nicely. We are not talking about uh, crash absorbers. We are talking about seeds, for example. Um, so this should be able to have some um, fiber shearing, for example, before the material actually fails. Um, there could, and there is pre-shearing, so they want to take care of the uh, draping results as well. So we had a look, or especially the University of Kaiserslautern had a look into the uh, Diana manual and came and tried to figure out what material to, to use. And this is the second motivation. So we had this project, so we had to do something. And then we said, okay, we need a new material and why is that? So first of all, the standard composite materials in LS Diner are tailored for UD reinforcements. Uh, here you see the, the classical list. Um, I take this away. Um, from 22 to 262, but when you have a closer look, they all look in the in the at least in damage and failure, they look like this. So you have some one distinct direction where that's the the fiber. Then you have a direction that is all always orthogonal towards it. So there is no way of modeling this shearing or pre-shearing. So if you have like one uh, fiber in 40 directions and the other in 80 or something like that which could happen from, from draping, then there's no way of modeling that with these materials. There are, on the other hand, materials for woven structures already in, um, in Diana, for example, this viscoelastic loose fabric or uh, micromechanics dry fabric. So they are from the same developers, so I just take them as one, basically. They always assume a symmetric woven fabric, dry fabric, um, we do not have too much experience with those, and they usually focus on the draping behavior. The same is actually true for, for another material, 249. Um, this is a material actually I implemented a while ago, um, but it's also tailored for, for draping. But this material, I'm sorry for the, uh, that it's hard to see here. Um, this is a material that actually can um, account for reorientation all these can actually, but it can also be defined with non-symmetric for non-symmetric uh, fabrics um, and um, can account for this reorientation. So, because I implemented it, so I know some of the code, and Prosa used this material actually also for tra traping, so we decided this is, will be the basis for our material development. So with that, let's see. Um, I'm going to present in this small section uh, the input, some coupling approach, less the plastic behavior. So this is the more or less general approach. Um, 
So let's start with the input. So the full name would be mud reinforced thermoplastic crash. Um, so, but I stick to 249 crash. I always, I only can remember the numbers, not the names. And you see the the, uh, the keyword input of it. So it's color coded by what the parameters are used for. So you have a couple of parameters for the um, for the matrix in blue, the standard material coordinate system definition. Uh, you have some parameters for the fibers, so you can have up to three fiber families, and also some new parameters for, for damage and failure. And in all cases, at least as, as long as nothing is damaged or fails, we have an additive split bet between the, the matrix and the fibers. Um, so let's start with the simpler ones. That's the, the matrix. Uh, it's in just as, basically it's MAT24. So that's basically it. Um, you can define a yield curve for the plastic, plastic behavior, uh, and you can say, okay, this, this flow curve can either be considered as a kin uh, the result of kinematic hardening or an isotropic, the other way around, isotropic or kinematic hardening or some mixed hardening approach. So that's, that's basically it. More interesting, I think, are, are the fibers. So internally, you can have up to three fiber families. So these are three vectors. This is a hyperelastic uh, formulation. So we always know the deformation gradient. And, and again, sorry for the um, for the presentation for the picture here. I hope you can see it. So when we shear the element, we see that the fiber orientation changes. So these this, this vectors actually change. Um, and based on this current position, orientation, and as well as the, the straining or stretch or compression of the fibers, we can associate it some kind of response to it. First of all, you can say, okay, if the fiber is compressed or it's, it's stretched, we want to have a, a compressive or a tensile response to it. Uh, and we always assume a tabular input. So you just define a load curve saying, okay, this is my stress versus strain response. More interesting is the shear stress response. So when we have two fiber families, as in this example, and we do this, uh, um, the shearing of this, of this element, we have a reorientation of the fibers. And of course, they have the, the the relative angle between those fibers changes, and we consider that as a shear. And we then uh, expect the user to define some tabular data telling us how to respond to, to it. So let's see again um, what it would look like. So this, for example, could be a response to shearing. Um, what you see here is, um, let's see if we can do that. Give me a sec. Uh, no, that's what I want to show. So you see, here's the response to it for uh, 0 0.90 or 1080 pre-shear. Uh, we start somewhere in the middle, um, and then we, we go up. And what you see is that we have a slight difference uh, in the responses, and this difference is just a nonlinear effect when we calculate the, the reorientation of the fibers, but still, that's not what you would expect from a locking, right? We had this, this locking effect at the end, and you would say when you have 10, 80 degrees pre-shear, I, I would expect the, the locking to start much earlier as compared to 0, 090. But bec because this, what you see here as a shear angle is just the change in the, uh, the angle between the fiber families, it doesn't account for that. So you can define this locking in a second variable, this is called the fiber angle. And again, I just to make it a bit more, a bit clearer. You see now uh, in, in light blue, another curve, that's the fiber angle. So this starts not with zero, but with 20 degrees because it has 10 AD. So we have 20 degrees pre-shear and you see this fiber. And if you continue, which is a bit hard to do, you see that the, the overall behavior has now changed as you would expect. So this, this locking starts in tensile direction must, much earlier and much later on the, on the left-hand side. 
So this is how we can associate a shear stress response um, for the fibers. Um, and again, as I said, we have this tabular input for nonlinear shear uh, uh, strain stress response. And it can either be nonlinear elastic or elastoplastic. And when we have elastoplastic, it's first to look into a uh, cyclic loading. And that's the result to it. So if you have a, cy a cyclic loading, you see such a behavior. So this is neither isotropic hardening nor kinematic hardening or something else. It's just something we came up with. We said, OK, the fibers um, stick on each other. So you have, some, and then at some point they start to slip. And we said, OK, always at the same force, we want to, the slip to start. Um, and that allows us to separate effects in influent shear behavior, because when you have, when you think about it, this material has some redundancy, right? We have a matrix and we have fibers, and then when, when you pull on it, what's what? Um, what effect? What what causes the the uh, reveal shearing, for example? And if you, for example, have a look just on the curves I've shown so far. So this was kinematic hardening. This is isotropic hardening. Then you have this fiber only simulation, also everything under shield loading. And then if you combine just, let's say, isotropic hardening with fiber only or with the fibers, then you see for a composite that would be your shear response to cyclic loading. And so you gain, when you do a cyclic loading test, you really see how the material behaves after uh, certain cycles, and then you can associate your your, uh, you can just uh, scale matrix and fibers. And that's actually what we did in this project for, for uh, a certain material model material. Uh, another interesting part of this material is that you have some uh, purely algorithmic parameters like post V or IHIS or something like that. I think uh, Tolga will talk about those briefly. Um, these allow you to add history variables as a user. You can say, OK, I'd like to see, for example, the fiber vectors I've shown here. They are not needed as a history for the material. The material has this deformation gradient and has this initial orientation. So it doesn't care about the current position. It doesn't have to store it. But if you like to visualize it, it's nice if you have those values. And so you can say, OK, I'd like to see it. So you put it to, to the post V. Uh, and then you see, for example, this, this data. And also there's another one if you want to use the, uh, uh, the results of a previous draping simulation, for example. You can give this the, the data in the initial history shell, so do not in file, so to say. Um, and this EHIS parameter tells the code how to interpret the, uh, the initial stress shell uh, card. So you don't have to have the, all the data. You can just say, OK, the f number 5, 6, 7 will, for example, be the, the fiber orientation. The rest I skip. And then you get, for example, this is, was 1, 1, 0 in global coordinates. So it looks like this. And 1 minus 1, 0, it will uh, the, the, the fiber is in this direction this diagonal direction. So this is not much difference from uh, the standard 249, but now we come to uh, 249 crash. And I'd like to talk about the, the uh, softening algorithm and the basic concepts. So first of all, it has to fit to the rest of the material. So we stick to a phenomenological approach here at this material. So we stick to a tabular input for everything. Um, and what we what we said, OK, the fiber, um, the, the change of the fiber state can cause damage and failure. That's the one assumption we made. So you see it here in this, um, and I repeat the input, you see here, these are the parameters that saying, you, OK, this is the fiber damage or the matrix damage with respect to the deformation of fiber 1. Um, of course, reorientation, so if you rotate the whole thing, can also cause damage, so the matrix damage at least. So if fibers uh, have initially uh, 0, 90 degree, and at one point they are completely aligned, there's not much matrix left, I hope, or I guess. So we have this 
additional parameter where we can say, okay, the, the matrix is damaged due to fiber reorientation. And the other assumption we made here is that the matrix itself cannot trigger damage and failure. So everything is triggered by fiber deformation. So that's just a basic assumption. Um, last but not least, uh, we have some uh, artificial um, fiber viscosity that you can apply just to avoid a snapback, but usually it's not needed, I'd say. But we applied it. So now, let's, so there is one equation for, for damage as well. Um, forget about it. Um, so let's just have a look at the uniaxial uh, tensile test only in, fi in one fiber direction. So this would be the, this is the fiber strain, this is the fiber stress. So yeah, it's one to one, so it's just a, a linear or constant uh, between those. So now if we now assume such a, a damage uh, or a softening behavior, so we say we reduce our stresses uh, with, that, with this curve, so we have a small plateau where nothing cha uh, uh, is changed, but then we reduce our stresses by 60%, let's say up to, I don't know, what is it, 40-something, uh, 4.5% uh, uh, stretch or something like that. So if we take those two and repeat the model and have a look at the hysteresis or the, the polar curve, you see here in red, uh, fiber strain versus fiber stress. So this is the undamaged behavior, and now you see we have a real damaged behavior, so we always hit the origin of the curves, um, and we reduce symmetrically. So if we reduce the stresses on the tensile stress, uh, tensile um, loading, also the compressive uh, stresses are reduced by the same manner. And that might not be what you want, so we said, okay, uh, that was also an idea Prosa came up with, or they demanded to have a non-symmetric behavior. So they wanted to have um, one curve for the damage under compression and one for the damage under tensile. So what we do, we always do evaluate this, the softening parameters for compression and for tensile. So in any case, we do that. And then we just have a look on what to apply, what damage parameter to apply. So if we are in the, in the compressive phase, we only take the compression softening parameter. And if we are in the tensile phase, we take the tensile um, softening parameter. So, so if you repeat this, and I'm not sure if you have seen these curves here. So what we did is we used the same curve as before for the tensile, for this damage T, but for the compressive, part, we said, okay, we do not want to have any um, damage evolution in the tensile curve. So if you, te uh, you, you stretch your fibers, they might break or elongate a bit, but under compression, they can take, in this sense, the whole, uh, the whole loading. But it's not really, uh, it's just a limit case. I just want to show what's happening. And you see it here, and I'm trying to enlarge it a bit. Um, and I do it with this wonderful uh, tool here just to show you what's happening. So what you see, so what you will see is that we have the same behavior as before in the tensile regime. But if you get into the compressive re regime, you see, for example, we start with the undamaged, uh, the undamaged fiber. Then at one point we come to the same result as before and so on and so forth. So, so we do not uh, see the pre-damage from the uh, from fiber tension. So, and then we say, okay, we the integration point fails, so it's much simpler than Gizmo. If we have this fail, we, we delete the element if all fibers have reached 100 percent um, damage. Matrix is much uh, simpler. I just fly over it. The, the idea we have that we want to have that the a fully damaged matrix not necessarily triggers element deletion. And what you said, okay, but perhaps you want it at one point. <laughs> so what you said, okay, of course you can only so soften 100%, but this damage parameter in your load curve, you can go up to 1.5, one, one, 1 and if you hit 1.5, then the L it tells the code, okay, that's enough. We are done here. So this is what you see. 
uh, when you run such a simulation. So if you uh, say, okay, the fiber should uh, eventually, or the, the matrix uh, should trigger the, the problem, then we here in this case, and here the matrix is 100% softened and, and failed, but there is no element deletion, and the fiber still is, is, uh, is it's there. So, just allow me a few examples. It's basically a proof of concept. Uh, first of all, I'd like to show you this uh, three-point branding test of a head profile, the woven reinforcement or an NCF. Again, just I took relatively realistic data um, for it, but I just said, okay, I want to see a difference. So for this woven, I said, okay, we want to have some uh, failure if fiber reorientates. So this was this damage one, two. Um, and if you enlarge it you know, like this and just have a look at the, 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 the critical part of the of your head profile, you see just a completely different behavior. So this is really uh, color-coded is the um, matrix damage. So what you see is there is some reorientation of fibers in this model that are in, is enough to lead to fiber uh, matrix damage, which eventually will, of course, not support the fiber anymore, and so on and so forth. So it just gives you another other results. Um, and then I also have this impact example I also took from the Extreme project, and here you see some words about the funding. We have seen it uh, this morning um, from the uh, TU Dresden bit. So this was a Horizon 2020 project, um, and I took the validation uh, design um, that, that, that was developed in this, and I'd like to say, Sorry for what I did to your model. Uh, it was, we have seen this morning, it was completely very fine, very nice, uh, comp complex uh, setup of the model. And I just closed my eyes, deleted everything, um, and reduced it to such a stupid model. It's just a shell model, <laughs> constant thickness, same layout everywhere. I just wanted to show something, right? Uh, <laughs> so um, you see the results. Um, I hope you can see the results eventually. Here, yeah. So this is the whole model. This is a, a close-up for a uh, quasi-isotropic composite. So just to show you, okay, that's how it will uh, fail. And, and it, I wanted to test, is the model able to, to deal with such high forces, with all this distraction, this extremely uh, dynamic uh, examples? And then, of course, I played around and again, the answer is similar to this morning because I can. Um, I played around with the orientation. So this is a plus minus 30, uh, 45 degree, uh, zero uh, 90 degree. And you see completely different uh, failure models, failure modes. And what I find rather interesting, if you go to minus 40, 40, which is not that much of a difference, then again, completely different. It's just to show, okay, the material model can deal with this pre-sharing. No matter if that's really what you would expect or what, it's not calibrated. It's just to show the same material model results in completely different uh, uh, behavior if you choose the different angles and the pre-shearing uh, pre as you, yeah, I hope, I hoped it would do. So let's sum up. Um, I showed you this on new material model. I talked about uh, the description of damage and failure. As I said, it's only phenomenological, so no, no real evolution. Um, I showed you that we can do it. Fiber elongation compression is dealt with uh, individually. I also showed some applications. And what I couldn't show, but I, you have to believe, is that we did in this project a complete and successful calibration of the model. And for their um, loading cases, it, it was uh, quite promising and they had some good results with it. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And if there are questions, if we have time for it, I'm open. Thank you. So thank you, Thomas, for staying in time. Um, also, our passengers are happy about that. Um, I think we have time for one question. I checked already online. There is none. 
unfortunately. So I think they do not want to type something to YouTube or Google. Um, is there a question here in the audience? That is, seems not to be the case. Maybe I have one because we often work together also with other material models. Uh, which LS Dyna version I should use if I want to make use of this? I think it's in there in R12, but it has been released in R13 because before it was uh, uh, restricted to prosa only. Uh, uh. Uh, and also in R93DM. So, so. That's also interesting because many uh, customers from the automotive side work with these R93 version. So um, they are not, they are using a more checked one version, so to say. Um, okay, thank you again, Thomas, for your nice presentation. Um, might give a small applause for him again. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and with that, it's an honor for me to, um, okay to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Tolga Uster. I think he's now in the screen to be seen. Um, Tolga is, uh, held a diploma in computational mechanics from the University of Stuttgart. So Commas is the name of the course, I think. And um, he's project engineer. And I also would say he's developer, some kind of degree of developer for NVO. And with that, Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Oops. Um, as Matthias said, I'm Tolga Usta, and today I will talk about NVO and how we establish a closed process chain for fiber reinforced composites using LS Dyna and NVO combined in LS Opt environment. So, um, we developed NVO uh, together with uh, my colleague uh, Christian Liebold in Dynamore, and today. I will start with a short introduction about uh, what is NVO basically, and then we will uh, look at uh, directly for the uh, composite uh, mapping options for the composite uh, using two use cases, two or three use cases. And then uh, I will mention about yeah, NVO can also do other things, uh, other things than the, the composite modeling. And uh, I will share our future development plan. Uh, plan. Um, and if there is any questions, I will be happy to answer them. So let's start with the, what is NVO. So basically, it's a multi-purpose uh, mapping tool dedicated to LS Dyna that you can map the stress field, strain field, effective plastic strain fiber orientations. And also, you can uh, modify the history variables um, according to your application and material model. And if we just um, combine those applications under a couple of, um, uh, couple of um, titles, first of all, of course, the fiber reinforced plastics, mapping the fiber orientations or directions, um, and also metal forming, uh, bake hardening, and image processing. I have also ex uh, examples for the bake hardening and image processing in this slide, uh, in this presentation. Uh, and also the particle methods and temperature mapping is also possible. As an example, here on the, on the right side, we have the, the solid, me uh, solid mesh generation from the shell elements, as, a, as an example, and also the axisymmetric mapping of a soda can that um, we have a 2D simulation, and we can easily rotate it and compute the uh, stress strain or effective uh, plastic strain in 3D and map to the, to the consecutive simulation. Uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned, um, the particle methods is also uh, our interest for the mapping cases. So, of course, we are always open to um, integrate new processes to our software uh, regarding to mutual interest from uh, users and our side. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I guess everybody knows uh, knows the informations that stay uh, that that are presented here in this slide. But let's uh, draw the frame once again. So. Uh, composites in general, they are um, inhomogeneous and non isotropic uh, They are highly dependent on the material direction and the, also in in-plane and through the thickness. So if I walk on a, on a plane, it can change the direction as well as if I walk through the thickness of, a, for example, a shell element, uh, the, the directions of the, each integration point can be different than the other one. For example, a stacked layup uh, of an of a, of a, um, aircraft uh, wing. And we have relatively complex structures to map. So the information is discontinuous. Um, there is also the undulation effects that we can observe 
regarding to which scale that we would like to do the mapping. Uh, and also the, the fiber directions orientations, they vary from position to position. Therefore, for all those different modeling approaches, we have um, different, the different mapping approaches. Um, for example, how the fibers are defined in my source model, which I take the information. Is it a beam element or is it a shell element with the information comes from material or from the elements itself, like element shell beta or element solid ortho? Um, what's my element type? What's the in-plane formulation and through the thickness formulation? And um, should I have to do the homogenization uh, for the mapping? So I have multiple stacks for the source side, but I can only, um, only simulate with the one shell layer in the target side because of the model is bigger after the mapping. I cannot model the, the very fine model due to the, the computational cost. And how, how they are discretized in the short fiber reinforced applications. We will see them also. So first of all, um, I would like to share the, the mapping options that we uh, already have in NVO. Um, here, um, I can mention that we use the element-wise um, uh, classification. Like on the left side, we will see um, how, how I take my, my source data. So in this case, for example, the, the source mesh has the beam element. And on the right side, I have the target size uh, side information, which is, for example, in the shells. And in this case, for, the, for example, for the short fiber reinforced polymers, um, we have um, the third party software based classification because of the, 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 data, the, the data format that they use. Um, and finally, I will mention about, oops, where is my laser? Um, yeah, here, okay. Um, I will mention about the stochastic initialization option, which is different than the the, the, the continuous fiber and short fiber um, uh, reinforced plastics, it's, it's, it can be applied in micro scale and meso micro scale um, to, to, to introduce randomized material properties uh, to the structure. Um, and I will share the, as I said, I will uh, share some use cases, but please be free to think about outside of the box. So it's the use case that we defined. But of course, you can, you can always think, hey, OK, I can take out this step. But what happens if I use this one? So think like that, because I, I just want to share uh, how we utilize it. OK. So let's begin with the uh, continuous fiber use case. For this case, I would like to use the, the model that, um, that we have in the RNA 2036 uh, project, which is the Digital finger uh, in German and a digital fingerprint in uh, English that we would like to um, model um, a glass fiber composite, um, the housing cap uh, of the, 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 the power electronics housing of a, of a car. And we also want to integrate a sensor band on this structure to get the information during the production and also the service. Um, so for this case, on the left side, we, um, as you can see, we have a prototype process chain um, that we established during the, the method development uh, for the mapping processes to test the, what, what we implemented. Um, and in this use case, we will look at the beam shell, shell shell, and playbook shell mapping options using the MAT 249. Thanks to Dr. Klippel, I do not have to go too much de uh, detail in for, for this material model. And I just need to show where, where comes the information and where it goes. So, the step one, it's um, hard to see uh, for, from, for, for the people staying behind. It's the beam shell mapping, which means that um, I have a, um, there is a weaving process. And as a result of the weaving process, we have a source mesh. Uh, and all the fibers are represented as the beam elements in, uh, for example, in this case, 0 and 90 degrees. As we can see on the right, for example, the blue ones um, in this direction represents the one fiber, um, and the red one is the perpendicular to that one. And um, this represents our uh, source mesh. Information, which is the fiber direction, comes from the beams, 
Um, and the blue one is the shell model that represents my, um, my, my target mesh, which will be used for the draping simulation after this step. And the green one represents here the, the, the sensor band that, that is already integrated to, to that fabric during the weaving process. So um, that means we have different material properties where there is no sensor band and where there is a sensor band. And during the mapping process, we had to solve it. So, so let's keep it simple for a, for a second and just think there is no sensor band. So I have to map it. That's why I use the beam shell mapping option in NVO. I take the information from the beam, shell, uh, beam elements and map on the shells. On the shell side, I'm using the, the five true thickness integration points. And my target um, element type after the mapping is element shell composites. Why? Because I can assign different material IDs, which is the preparation uh, for the next step. So if I use the uh, sensor band, I can simply switch the material ID. And for the areas that I have the sensor band, I can change my material properties, but I do not have to change my part ID. And easily assign different material, material uh, card for the area that the sensor band lies on the target side by using the same source mesh. And to define the, the, uh, the fiber directions, I can easily use the his options of the MAT 249 or 49 crash in the global direction, uh, which um, all the positions where, where they should be stored in the target mesh uh, explained in the Elestina uh, manual, uh, the second volume. And I can simply look for the, um, for the target elements on the um, target elements which are um, related to the sensor band using the so-called, so we call them in NVO clustering, uh, clustering method. As long as a target mesh gets the information from the uh, sensor band. So if it just sends it, so it just switched the material ID in the element shell composite. So the user can later on define after this case two material cards, one for the uh, for the sim oops sorry oops, go back yeah um, oops yeah one for the the perfect fabric and one for the with the sensor band and after this process we can simply take our target mesh and go to the draping simulation and we can already see the sensor band elements here and. After the, result, after the draping simulation, there is one problem. At the end, for the final product, we have to obtain that sensor band perfectly horizontal. But due to the, the draping simulation, it just shifts in the middle. So to solve this one, and also, um, so let's go back there uh, later. So it shifts, first of all, it shifts because of the deformation, so it's, it's easy to know that. And um, this structure after the draping should withstand the deformations of the structure during its lifetime. So just do a one optimization and check uh, if it's okay to use this material directly or if I need any reinforcing patches at some places that it's needed. So after that, uh, during the project, our partner Altair did a did the optimization run and provided us four different patch configurations with a, with a certain thickness and for the different positions as we can see here. Um, is, is, it, is it good to see from back? Okay. And so if I visualize all of the all together here, so I have to somehow map those patches onto my draping simulation, uh, onto my um, the, the draping base fabric, but at the, after the deformation, they should be positioned as, as shown here. So I cannot directly apply them. It will be like the same for the sensor band. They will be shift somehow. Therefore, uh, we use the, the, the NVO playbook shell mapping option to compute 
the formation gradient between the deformed and undeformed configuration and find the elements, match them from the deformed configuration and by multiplying with the deformation gradient, pull them back in the undeformed configuration and then define the direction. So I have a, I have a fiber aligned zero degree in the undeformed configuration, but due to the deformation gradient, it will be rotated back some x degree in the undeformed configuration, and I have to apply that patch in that configuration before the draping, so at the end, after the draping, it will be in the correct position. And there is an, another, um, another uh, thing to consider that. Um, all the thickness of the, the reinforcing patches should be on top of the, uh, on top of the, ah, uh, once again on top of the, uh, that fabric. That's why we have to use the element shell thickness offset composite element card in the LS Dyna uh, with the offset option, which is um, direct, the direct uh, relevant of the, the, the option in the LS Dyna. That the, then the bottom of the fabric will be flat and the reinforcing patches will be applied on the top of that. And due to the diff element shell uh, thickness offset composite, some elements can uh, have different thicknesses than the others. Okay, so after that, does it help? Yes, it is. So if I just apply the deformation gradient and pull them back in the undeformed configuration, after the draping process, they will be aligned horizontally. So, there are three steps that we just skipped, which uh, is basically the, the, the generating uh, uh, a better mesh for the structural simulation. Um, is it so like Thomas? Um, how can I zoom it? Yeah, it's here, okay. Yeah, so basically, um, what we see here is that the elements expect, uh, aspect ratios are quite um, bad after the draping. So if you just continue for the structural submission, we will have some uh, inst instabilities. Therefore, we can easily create a, create a better mesh with a, with a better expect ra uh, aspect ratio, and we can simply map the information from, um, from the, the draping uh, simulation result onto the structural element, as you can also uh, see. Uh, we can also do the trimming simulation, uh, as Matthias uh, mentioned, that it's just the cutting out the, all the holes and the outer form and uh, create a better mesh and simply map the information from uh, source mesh to the target mesh using the shell shell option in this case. So it's just the one prototype, but we already used all the three, uh, but we already used the three different mapping options um, using the the source material model and also as the target material model MAT 249. Um, as Thomas said that in this case the post V option and his option is uh, our, uh, our the best helpers. And simply and, and once again the element shell thickness offset composite is used to used to handle maybe once again zoom here. So, once again here that, that we have the reinforcing patches only for the certain elements, not, not, all, not all of them. And after that, this structure is ready for the um, consecutive simulation. It, it can be a crash simulation, it can be a thermomechanical coupling, whatever. But as I said, it was a prototype, and it was two years ago. So right now, we have such bigger, uh, uh, bigger process chain realized in, uh, in LS Opt. And some of them, so basically, so let's point out first where, where we use NVIO. So right now we, we, we map not only one layer, we map multiple layers on a one shell uh, element and do the draping. And after the draping, apply the patches and apply my sensor so those elements should behave different than the, the pure fabric, apply the different um, material ID, 
and then uh, complete the, the process chain for the dynamic loading, fatigue loading, and thermal loading. So why we do that, why we, do, uh, why we need this, those mappings and why we do them in LSOP? So basically, um, during a process chain, there is no one and zero, like, like the computers. So there is always a tolerance. So I cannot always place my fabric perfectly zero degree um, regarding to a reference point. So it can be plus minus some five degree uh, it can be some plus minus five degrees. So in this case, if I do my mapping and just apply a continuous parameter range in the LS opt, I can study all those possibilities for the different com uh, combinations in the uh, already in the um, uh, before the draping and also after the draping. So somebody can also apply that those patches somehow wrong. So during the LS opt simulation, I can study a, a different variety of the, of the uh, uh, combinations and get the information from them. And also I can compare them um, how those products with such configurations um, work during their lifetime. Then I can get the feedback and I can also improve my production run or my production process. So I can, um, so if there's also the new load cases, so I can simply define another uh, case here and just one click solution and good to go. So I can reduce the engineering cost. I can save some material. If it's not necessary, I do not have to use them. And by combining with the, with the, with the service data, the production development and verification would be faster uh, and also, um, the predictive maintenance um, uh, properties are much more higher because I can get the information from the product because of the already integrated sensor data, already integrated sensors. Okay. And after the continuous fibers, um, now we will look at for the, uh, now we will talk about the uh, short fiber reinforced uh, composites. Uh, for this case, we have five uh, options. So basically they are um, only three formats, Moldex, 3D, Moldflow, and 3D Timon. Um, but it's a five because of the, the target case um, and the target size, uh, target side element types. So in this case, we have a um, process simulation, which is um, fiber injection molding. And we will have a, a, a fiber orientation distribution through the thickness over the, the, the source mesh elements. And we would like to map those orientations um, for the consecutive simulation on the target side. Uh, for this case, we, uh, we are using the MAT157 and MAT215. Uh, simply because, similar to the MAT249 option, we can initialize those informations as initial histories uh, after the mapping for the consecutive simulation. Why it is important? Uh, it's because of the, the skin core effect of the process itself. So through the thickness, the fiber orientations are changes. Um, so let's look at the MAT157. What are the advantages? It's basically, we can define the fiber orientations and also the stiffness tensor of that fiber orientation regarding to the, the, the assumptions and ansatz that, that we are using. Um, some options are already implemented in NVO, so you can go and look for the uh, manual and get the information about it. Um, one recent development for uh, MAT157 is that, that you can combine it with already defined material card by defining a NVO orient information here. It's, it's, it represents the eigenvalues of the fiber uh, orientation tensor. And this material card can be combined with the, uh, another MAT at damage card. Then in this case, we can uh, give the material ID via the elemental composite. And by defining the fiber orientations and uh, the, uh, and the constitutive, uh, constitutive parameters, uh, the user can define their own uh, damage behavior for that, uh, for that orientation. And of course, what we would like to achieve is that just do the mapping and after that, we, we, we should be able to have a better 
a representation of the experiments after the mapping, which is shown here in, in green for the MAT 157, and the gray is the experimental data. And the other material card is the MAT 215. Um, in this case, we do not have to do too much, so we just need to map the fiber orientations, and there's already a and ansatz, uh, ansatz defined in, the, in this material model, and it computes its stiffness tensor uh, in LS Dyna. Um, here we can see once again the skin core effect, and this is the paper of uh, our colleagues from the Dynamo Nordic. They studied uh, MAT 215 with, with the NVO mapping, and here we can see the skin core effect uh, very well. And for the stochastic initialization, so basically it's the um, randomized port distribution in the structure. So um, to, to mimic the effects of the pore. So if there is a pore, it, which means that there's, there is no material, so there is no stiffness, there is no stress answer. But it should be distributed according to the experimental measurements to, um, regarding to some information, like um, I can, compute, uh, I can uh, get my maximum porosity in percents after the experiment, and um, what, what are my, um, and the pore sizes, minimum, maximum, and the all pores should be distributed between those numbers, but randomly, uh, and um, which, which should have also satisfy the maximum porosity, and after the pore effect, I should have such a different force um, stress strain behavior for the same material, same model, but different NVO runs, we, we just get a, get a different answers regarding to how my pores are distributed or positioned. Um, it's, co it's completely random, but reproducible. Uh, with, a, with a simple modification, this implementation can also mimic the inclusions. So it's not, not anymore so, so soft, but then harder. Okay, so that's it for the composites and the further applications, as Matthias mentioned today, about the aluminum uh, heat treatment, the bake hardening effects are quite uh, important for the aluminums. Uh, in NVO, we can use the equation parser option to, 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 to map the, the temperature data of the, um, of, the, uh, of the bake hardening process and can compute the different hardening parameters for the different sections of the cars. And which is also quite new, uh, so quite new enhanced, the, the, the grayscale mapping, which is basically um, you have a picture uh, in the grayscale and then you want to map the information regarding to what is my uh, degree of the grayness of that image. For example, if you have a wood and you have early wood and um, late wood properties different and also in color, so if it's in the black white, you will get different um, uh, grayscale uh, values and different material properties. And similarly, in this case, for example, it's the adhesive zone, which is the industrial adhesive applied, but the, the adhesive does not um, distribute it evenly. And if after the, um, after the test, we have uh, high and low spots, and after switching to the grayscale image, we will have different grayscale values, and then mapping to the for the later, uh, later uh, and mapping them on the, on the simulation, we will have different force and um, displacement results regarding to those. And the future development plan, uh, plan um, the uh, um, NVO is a part of the Dynamo ecosystem, which all together combine under one uh, licensing uh, server and licensing uh, applications. Currently, we have, we have more than 180 uh, quality assurance examples that run through uh, before uh, every release that we try to have backward compatibility and also the uh, also 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 we can we can make sure that NVO still works for the old implementations uh, we recently developed the uh, the graphical user interface uh, the sudden uh, the recent developments on the IGA mapping and also the GOM image considerations and as I said before, now we are planning to have a new um, ecosystem licensing server, which is uh, hopefully will be launched in the next year. Um, 
that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. It's okay. So, uh, Targa, thank you for your for your nice presentation, and um, that was interesting because I learned some new keywords today. So, also from your speech. So, thank you all. Um, are there questions in in the audience on that NVO mapping? I think there are no questions online, still not yet, so maybe America still sleeps, I don't know. Um, uh, maybe I have one, uh, because I do something with the temperature mapping. Um, how long in your process uh, did the mapping uh, take? So how many time you, you need? Uh, for the example you shown from the arena, I think it was. How, how long? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, for, for, for the arena case, we have quite a small um, example. It just takes a couple of seconds. For the bigger applications, let's say I have one and a half million elements. Um, and in this case, I have all the information on the elements, which is it does not multiply with some coefficient. It takes less than 10, 10 minutes. So to be exact, it depends, of course, on the computer uh, performance seven minutes or eight minutes. But if there is a eight million elements with the seven or nine true thickness integration points, which is directly multiplied, uh, but it's still less than, a, less than an hour. So, uh, so if, if, if they compared with the simulation, it's much more less. Yeah. Should, 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 be. should be. Should be less. OK. So uh, thank you, Otorga, for your presentation. Um, with that, it's maybe another applause. If you mind, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, for the online audience, we have here a very uh, small room, and maybe the air is getting a bit uh, warmer and warmer, so we try to um, avoid behavior. Um, oh, yeah, we can open the window for a short time. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, you already uh, learned him today. Uh, it's Niels Karajan. Um, he has a PhD in computational mechanics, I hope I remember correct. And um, at LS Diner, I would say he is senior project engineer for special topics. Something like that. Um, and with that, I'm interested to see your presentation. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, hello again. I am aware that I'm the last one in between the cake and uh, <laughs> the release for the day. Um, so I'll keep it. I'll keep it short, and uh, we'll see. So, the the slides I'm presenting here today um, um, were generated together with uh, my colleague Skylar in the U.S. while I was still in the located in the U.S. and then um, I moved back to Germany last summer, and uh, in close collaboration with Inyaki and Pierre from from Ansys LST who are the de developers of the electromagnetic uh, module. <clears throat> so there's a, a, a quick overview of the talk. So I have a, a short motivation. Oops. And um, we'll look at a modular single cell model. And then we extend that to several cells. We have a more detailed look at the structural module of such a battery cell. And then at the end, I'll try to bring it all together and uh, present some strategies how we can solve these problems. <clears throat> so what is the motivation? The greatest concern is that um, um, we look at the cascading cell failure in, in batteries. And um, so, for instance, you have a crash event and, and you trigger one of the cells in the battery pack into a thermal runaway, and that releases a lot of... Uh, energy. So if it goes into an exothermic reaction, that energy can be spread to neighboring cells, which again can be triggered into a thermal runaway. And then you get cascading cell failure and the whole battery pack would blow up, relatively violent. And uh, yeah, you, you, of course you want to prevent that. <clears throat> and uh, so how do we tackle this in Elastina. Uh, we've, we've seen the different solver couplings that, that are available a couple of times already. Um, so in this talk, I want to build a multi-physics model, what is possible at the moment. And that would consist of a thermal module, an electromagnetic module, and uh, a structural module. <clears throat> so starting with the thermal module, 
um, we can have a look at the uh, microstructure of, of such a cell. So this is a cylindrical cell, how you would find it in a Tesla or um, newer BMWs will have that kind of cell or I think even VW, so it, it seems to be um, yeah, highly used. And the, the battery itself is essentially these, these sheets of active material and a separator in between and then they get wrapped around and so you have this kind of a cylindrical shape. And uh, if you think of uh, how, the, how heat can flow in that structure, you have to cope with that anisotropic effect. So it can go in vertical direction and in, in a tangential direction much easier than it can, can go in, in radial direction. And uh, so you can include that by defining thermal conductivities in uh, so the so-called in-plane, different from the so-called out-of-plane or radial direction. Then we describe a heat capacity and a density, and that is about it, what we need for our thermal solver to compute heat distribution problems. <coughs> and uh, so we can calibrate these material parameters with a little example, for instance. We have a heating patch on such a battery, and we'll measure the temperature uh, underneath the heating patch and at, at other points if, if we want to. And um, so the, the way we bring energy into the battery would be through the, the boundary flux keyword. So we um, prescribe a heat flux um, that, that, that goes into the structure. And we found values from literature where people were actually blowing up these batteries with the heating patch and we used just the initial part um, for calibration of our model. <clears throat> and relatively quickly, we achieved these, these good agreement here. And of course, when you can send in energy into your structure, you can also take it out again. So the, we've also learned about these two boundary conditions already. So there's the convection and the radiation boundary condition. And both of these are, um, let's say, simplified approaches that, um, that depend on a temperature difference. So in, in case of the convection, um, the, the, the driving gradient is the temperature difference between some infinity temperature outside and the temperature on the surface. And then you have um, the heat conduction, um, yeah, uh, co co the, the, the convection parameter. And then depending on the geometry and how there is the, the configuration, it, yeah, it is in this range, let's say from three to nine watts per meter squared in Kelvin. And let's say if you have a forced convection where a fan is blowing onto something, uh, this can be, um, of course, increased. <coughs> exact values can be found with uh, CFD simulations, but um, I think for the engineering purpose, this should serve the, um, our purpose well. Uh, the radiation is, is also a temperature difference, but, but now the temperatures are to the power of four. So that is a completely different range what we're talking at. Uh, about and um, but the structure of the formula is the same so we have a, a gradient here and we have some kind of factor that is multiplied by that and then that is the energy that um, gets taken away by radiation so again there's something an infinity temperature um, that I need to define <coughs> the next module would be the electromagnetic module and if you think of the battery um, it has these these distinct layers. So you have an, uh, uh, the current collectors on, on the ends and they're coated with a positive electrode and the negative electrode. And they're separated by a semi-permeable membrane. <coughs> and then you have these lithium ions that can pass this, um, this semi-permeable membrane. And when you charge a battery, you would move these from one side to the other. And when you discharge it, they would go to the opposite side. So People interested in optimizing the, the electrodes would actually compute the movement of the ions, how it goes through these, um, through these uh, thin layers. But since we are interested in a, in a, in a coarser scale, just on how much energy the, the battery can store and how much can be released, uh, we need to find a substitute model for, for a battery. <clears throat> and this is typically done with the so-called equivalent lumped circuit models where we don't look at the ions in particular that, that will go through the battery, but we just mimic how the cell would behave. 
So if you look at that, we have the current collectors, and we can define a negative and a positive potential. And every cell has an open circuit vol uh, voltage, so that would be this element. And how the cell behaves is this rheological element. So there's two resistors and a capacitor. And uh, you, you can have more complicated um, models of these where you have a, an, an array of, let's say, another assembly of a resistor and a capacitor. Um, but for our purposes, this is complex enough. And, and we can mimic what's going on in this cell. Now, this is nothing really special. A lot of codes offer this. So it's not only Elastinand. Uh, you will also find this in Fluent or Star CCM Plus. And um, <clears throat> they call it slightly different, but the idea is always the same. And um, there's one more important step that we need to do. <clears throat> so this one, in, in Dyna we call this Randall circuit, is actually not one Randall circuit, since we have a spatial resolu resolution with finite elements. So if we look at a, um, so a, a, a battery cell, we have a finite element mesh, and then we have the anode and the cathode and the separating membrane in between. And then Alastina would bridge the elements of the current conductors um, with this Reynolds circuit. Okay, so every element uh, on one side and the other is going gonna, is gonna to be bridged internally. And the finite elements in between, they're just there to carry the mechanical signal as well as the thermal, um, the, the heat. Okay. <clears throat> And so this way, we can ha uh, prescribe a partial s short circuit of the battery. So if, if we have an indentation somewhere in the cell, we can locally short circuit that cell and see what's going on, how it will discharge through that short circuit. <clears throat> now, the Randall circuit itself came a long way. Um, it started, I think, 10 or 15 years ago um, in the US. Ford and the Department of Energy in the US, together with LSTC, they were investigating uh, a method how you can couple deformation with the charge and discharge behavior of battery. And um, so the first results were basically, as I just described it, you would, you would model each cell, which is in the scale of a battery module or battery pack, very tedious to impossible, I would say, to do that. <clears throat> So after people started using that, um, I think it was in 2014, 2015, people realized if I go to a bigger structure, this is very tedious. So the next step was that you could, you, um, well, it is especially tedious because the time step in explicit simulation is very small for these very thin layers. So they're only the region of 100 microns. So you have an element size of 100 microns with this super small. <clears throat> so then the idea was, well, we'll take the structural mesh and use this on thick shells. And inside a thick shell, we can just define um, like several battery cells that would then be generated internally. And um, the thermal part, as well as the electromagnetic part, would still go on a finer resolution. So that brought some relief, but not all the way. <clears throat> and then it was, I think, Three or four years ago, a medical company came to LSSC and they wanted to do heart modeling. And if you, you model the heart, you have to have a, an activation wave. And it's an, also an electric wave that, that activates the heart muscle to contract. And this is usually done by a so-called bi-domain equation, where you can have um, the, the electric field superimposed with your mechanical field. <clears throat> so the, when the electrical wave goes over it, it will contract the muscle. And so that idea got carried over to the battery modeling, where we can have now the two fields of the positive and the negative potential superimposed on the same mesh of, the, of a mechanical field. So we can now use solid elements in the size that we would like to use them for to capture the mechanical deformation, but still are able to, to have a charged battery in there, <clears throat> short it and discharge it and uh, see what's going on with the thermal. And then um, um, that was sort of the door opener to do battery models and battery packs. And then people got creative and said, well, if I just want, like, I have part of my battery pack in a crash, but the rest is not being deformed, but it's still there as an energy source. So you can, <clears throat> you can cut out that complete pack and represent that with a, 
um, uh, just one Randall circuit as an energy source. Okay, and I think if you have a, a module or battery pack in mind, there's no no other way than using this um, so-called BATMAC model. <clears throat> and the BATMAC model is relatively simple, so um, it is based on the resistive solver on, uh, that we have <laughs> learned from, from this morning uh, from M Matthias. And uh, so the resistive sol uh, heating solver needs a, an electrical conductivity. So we need to prescribe that for the collector tabs. And it needs the electrical conductivity of the anode and the cathode. <clears throat> and due to the structure of the battery, this can be anisotropic again, just like we had this for the um, um, for the thermal conductivity. Um, the Randall circuit itself, I don't want to go into detail with it, it's essentially there's a calibration process which is standardized and then you will get the parameters and it will just work. So instead I want to, to show what you can uh, do with that. <clears throat> so assume we have a charged battery and then uh, we want to bring this into a short circuit. There's several ways how we can do that. So we can use a stress or strain criterion, we can use a displacement uh, criterion, or let's say a temperature criterion, which is the one I will be using for this presentation. And so in Dyna, this is done with this user-friendly function, um, where you have all these variables up here you have for your disposal to, to come up with a, a, a logic that would trigger a short. So what's happening in a short, these Randall circuits are substituted with the resistance, and that is usually smaller than, than the Randall circuit itself, so the discharge takes place over the short circuit, and due to the energy all flowing through that short circuit, it will heat up locally, okay? <clears throat> and you will see in this video, I'm going to heat on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see the state of charge. So if it's red, it's fully charged, and then I'm heating up here on the left-hand side. At some point, I get the short circuit, and it discharges pretty quickly. So um, that was just a proof of concept uh, that, in principle, this works. Now, the short circuit itself is not blowing up a battery yet. So a battery, I have also learned, actually burns. So, but it just... So it takes some energy that it actually burns. So just like when you take a piece of wood and you want to burn it, um, if you don't put in too much energy, you will not ignite an exothermic reaction. So the, the, the wood will just um, yeah, stop burning again. <clears throat> and it's the same with the battery. So the electric short can give you that extra trigger to bring it to ignite, right? And then essentially the EM is over with and, and the, the reaction that takes place is very violent and it's essentially a chemical reaction. So this is why you will find the exothermic reaction in, in the load keyword. So there's a so-called one equation model where you have a lengthy equation that gives you the reaction kinetics and that is multiplied the, by the volume specific carbon content. So in other words, what, uh, what's your mass that can be burnt? and uh, the specific heat release. And with the one equation model, it's like one lumped model for the whole battery. And then people said, well, battery consists of several constituents. So the, the sum of the constituents is the everything. So we need to sum everything up and just have the same thing for each constituent. And once I saw this, I said, well, I don't have any experimental facilities to do something. I don't understand these equations. Well, I do, I do understand them a little bit, but I don't know how to feed them with the parameters. So I was looking for another approach uh, that is more engineering-like. <clears throat> and um, so we did an experiment where we heated up a battery cell, and um, at some point there was a short circuit, and then it would heat up a little more, and then it would go into exothermic reaction and come back down. So I just computed that with the short circuit, and then like my green curve just completely missed that hump. And then I thought, well, all I'm missing is the hump, so I need to feed in energy to match that hump, and then I roughly get it, right? In, in, in literature, you can find, let's say, an energy release function. Some people suggest it has this shape, um, so this is over temperature, 
And then you can program this shape into a define function tabulated. And again, very user friendly, you can, <laughs> uh, you can go in this table and, and grab the right exothermic release um, based on the temperature you already reached. And um, so the, the trick is here, um, I can define a burn temperature, which I can take from my um, experiment. And, and once I reach the burn temperature, I can burn stuff and I go into this, uh, into this function. And then I told you about some activation energy. So I introduced some kind of offset here. So I want to make sure once it starts burning, it, it releases some, some good amount of energy that it, I will have consistent burn. And then to, to find the shape of this curve from the experiment, I included a scale factor of this thing so I can release more or less energy and also change how, how, how widespread this is. And then all I have to do is check what is the maximum I can burn and every time I reach that maximum that element cannot burn anymore. Okay, So if everything has been burned, um, that's it. And um, the funny thing is I get quite a good result. Uh, so there was a, a test like this. Uh, the heating up is match, matching exactly. Then I, uh, the peak is predicted uh, very well. Where I fail is, is how it cools off. <clears throat> um, but that's sort of easily explained because this is an autoclave test and I, I didn't get the boundary conditions right. So when, when this blows off inside here, the, the environment temperature gets hot. So my T infinity of the, the radiation and the convection boundary condition gets also is a function over time. I, I thought, well, I'd simply take the function over time, but if I don't match the, the ignition point exactly, then my boundary condition becomes the ignition point because I prescribe uh, that the heat is coming from the outside. So, um, yeah, at, at first I, I was bothered by this, but um, I'll give an explanation uh, pretty quickly. So here you can see this, the simulation. There's a heating spiral going around it. It's heating up. And then uh, you have an exothermic reaction. It heats up pretty quick and then it cools down. So after trying this for a while and then concluding that with, with our simple means, this is not really possible, I thought a, a bit further. And then I said, well, a battery like this is not going to be isolated in a battery module or pack. So usually, if, if you ever seen the videos on, on YouTube where people disassemble a, a Tesla battery, there's like they pour in this pink stuff. Uh, it's like a, an insulator or, or, or a, um, uh, not really insulator, it's a, a con connectivity paste that um, connects essentially all cells together. So there's no void space in, in there. So I, I don't think if something like that in the module would go blow up that these boundary conditions play a big role. <clears throat> so I was happy that I could predict this. And flowing heat through, let's say, solid medium and contact is much easier. We can measure all that and then um, simply compute it. Which brings me to the, um, to the last thing. So in case we have some contact where the heat has to flow through, um, Elastina offers the thermal option in the contact. And uh, we can, let's say, define an active layer. And if... if one part sees another part within that active layer, um, we have a, a conductivity and a radiation active inside that gap. Um, if the gap is closed, we have a solid thermal conductivity, pressure dependent if we like, and if we're bigger than the gap, we have no um, conductivity at all. Okay, so very simple. Um, it can be extended by view factors and everything, but I don't think it's, it's really necessary to do that. <clears throat> and then for this setting, we also did a proof of concept where we trigger this one cell into a thermal runaway, and this by contact would, would bring the heat to cell number two and three. So they also heat up, go into a short circuit, but they don't go into a thermal runaway, and then the, third, uh, the fourth cell just heats up and nothing happens with that. Well, actually, it does short, uh, but it, it doesn't go in a thermal runaway either. Yeah, so that was a proof of concept that the, let's say, the multi-physics model in principle is working, um, and it is now a matter of calibration. Now, calibrating these things is very, very difficult. Um, uh, what I didn't mention is that that 
usually you measure like one point on the battery surface <clears throat> and you have to have sheer luck that exactly at this point the exothermic reaction starts if it starts off the opposite side uh, but you compare it with the, uh, with the model uh, where your exothermic reaction starts right under the measuring point, it'll be completely different. So I think there's always some kind of fuzziness in these simulations because it's very hard to uh, experimentally pin this down. Okay, so that was the, let's say, blowing up part. Um, and in the beginning we thought everyone is kind of interested in, in doing the whole battery thing. And then we learned that... Uh, or everyone learned that this is very complex to do. <laughs> so the people that are responsible for crash analysis, they kind of back, back down a bit, and, and, and now they're only responsible for uh, the deformation of the battery, and they need to predict when does the short happen, uh, but, but then it's not their problem anymore if what happens to the battery pack. There's a different group that, that deals with the stability of the battery pack. So to predict the short circuit, um, you have to do a, a, a solid well, a mechanical model. So either on a micro scale where you actually resolve your structures and you have your, your separator and um, uh, that can break and then you have the short. And, um, but these are very tedious and you get, get a lot of elements, right? Um, and let's say we have a cell here with a million elements we applied these materials, nothing really special. And by just taking values from the literature, we kind of matched the experimental curve that we did on this, on this cell. Uh, we're currently peeling this thing apart and trying to pull each of the, um, of the layers, which is also tedious. But, uh, and we're hoping to get a better match, especially capture the failure, failure here. Yeah. Um, the same. Here on a different load case, this is a plate going down, not a cylinder, uh, similar thing. Then you can think of mesoscale models where you homogenize, um, let's say, your micro scale and, and, and uh, coarsen some of the layers. So 10 layers you represent by one layer, for instance, and, and, and use a, a part composite uh, where internally you, had, you would represent your, your single layers. Uh, but that has geometric limits, yeah. Then you could think of another way where you just have concentric circles. So who knows, maybe that is useful too. Um, a group I'm working with, this is uh, the University of Graz and we're in a research project together. Um, um, this, is, this is called um, Safe Lip, which is the, um, the second project of the Safe Battery. And in Safe Battery, they were developing this mesoscale model. And uh, essentially what's left is, is one shell in the middle and a pouch, and that is connected with these beam elements. And um, they can re represent the deformation behavior ve very well of the cell, so you, it's relatively easy to calibrate. It runs fast, so it, this whole pouch cell only has 1,700 elements or 1,800. But you cannot predict the failure of the membranes. Yeah. That's a shortcoming, but um, it, it might be very useful because I think to represent the rest of the pack that is not in danger in failing, you might as well take this model and then only replace areas that, that are in danger of uh, membrane uh, failure. Um, you use a microscopic model. Yeah. So that could be one way. Um, other people use macroscale models. So the idea is to have just solid elements. And then you have, so the microstructure is not, not there anymore with your elements. So all what's happening on the microstructure, for instance, if you have these real layers, you pull the inside out, you get this telescope effect. This you have to capture with the back door through your material model. So, and, and um, one model where you could use this is the mat modified honeycomb. And the reason why people use this is uh, because you can decouple the normal from the shear. And this way, um, you can, to some extent, get this kind of deformation. But there's limits because the, the solid elements won't cope with all that deformation. So at some point, there's the, the, simply the end of the line, whereas this, the, the liars would still slide on top of each other. Right? So <clears throat> you can argue. Uh, you probably won't see this in a real load case in the battery, so, <laughs> but it's just to um, 
you know, show the, show the effect here. And this kind of um, model was also done by the, the Fraunhofer and, and they compared different, different approaches and uh, so they also liked the modified honeycomb here. Okay, so how do we bring it all together? In Elastina, we could do everything fully coupled, so uh, on the same time scale, which is very tedious because we have to do all physics fields and solve them simultaneously on the time step that uh, uh, we're basically running. So this is the explicit time step. Um, we can bridge, uh, let's say that the, the EM doesn't have to go every explicit, but is very, very expensive. Yeah. So one idea could be to say, well, let's decouple things and the crash is very short, just 100 milliseconds and, and it's not going to heat up much in 100 milliseconds. So we run the crash up front and then we see where the short is and, and do uh, the short and the heating up simulation afterwards in a frozen geometry. <coughs> yeah. Um, so extended two-step would be, let's say, we do a full vehicle crash and to predict the using macroscale battery models and then to predict the short we would cut out the battery pack, replace the critical areas with the microscale model, run it again, predict the areas where we shorted and then freeze it and run the stability of the battery. Yeah. So those are ideas that people are currently investigating, uh, that we are also investigating in these research project, uh, projects. And uh, so that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I think I've, I've success, successfully shown how we can couple the different solvers. Um, if everything is needed or not is, is yet to be proven. Um, I think this is still a topic of research and it, it's relatively open where we go. Um, what I didn't mention is that we, so what we lack is what happens with the hot vent gases. So inside a battery pack, there's not much air. So, so whenever one cell go, blows up, this is in the range of 30 to 300 liters of hot gas at 1,000 degrees Celsius that comes out. That needs to go somewhere. So, and, and this hot gas, wherever it passes other cells, it might ignite those as well, right? And uh, so that's open question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so Niels, uh, thank you for your ignite, ignite, ignation, no, igniting um, speech. <laughs> uh, we also have hot hair inside uh, the room, so I hope we do not ignite. Um, is there a way to, to sim uh, one question maybe from my side, is there a way to, to simulate that gas with LS Dyna? To capture that ignition, ign ign ignition, ignition. Sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, another sorry. So the the ignition itself is, I think, not possible to do with with Elastina. So um, you could do a substitute model with the CPM where we use the airbags. Uh, we could. Um, that's actually something we want to try. Um, if if the battery. Uh, releases the gas, we, we treat this as an inflator of, a, of an airbag and see how the particles would go. And I think the first cell that blows up is going to be responsible for the structural damage to the battery pack. So we could uh, hopefully predict the structural, battery, uh, the, the structural damage. But in terms of the stability of a battery pack, this is a process over minutes and I, I don't think we can do that in Dyna. So we would need a, a, a switch to ANSYS Fluent or a Star CCM Plus. But at the moment, there does not exist such an interface where we can simply take the deformed configuration of the LS Dyna run and bring it into the fluid, fluid code, right? So because they are fundamentally different on, on how to set up um, the problems. Yeah. So maybe that is future research, I think. OK, thank you for your answer. Um, I was impolite, sorry. Are there questions from the audience? This does not seem to be the case. I think, I, uh, not yet, <laughs> no. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much for your interesting speech. And uh, may maybe one short question from, from my side. Uh, the, the, uh, the thermal conductivity, uh, no, the electric conductivity of the cells, was it, uh, do you assume it to be constant or was it temperature dependent? And does it play a role? Those quantities are all temperature dependent and, and also state of charge dependent. 
So uh, what the battery does, and, and then the, um, yeah, you, you, I don't know about the okay. tip of my head, yeah. <clears throat> okay, okay. Um, thank you again. So thank you, Niels. Um, with it, with it, I would also um, tell goodbye to our streamers or uh, to our online audience. Um, we tried to find a solution for the first two uh, speeches to also make them available to you with sound. I think we will send you an email if we managed uh, that. Um, it really requires some work, so do not expect it tomorrow, but we will work on that because uh, yeah, we want the first speeches also online. Um, with that, uh, thank you and goodbye online. And please, the audience in the room, stay for one more minute. I switch to German. So... <laughs>